Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Part One, Chapter Eighteen Four Thousand Leagues Under the Pacific. By the next morning, November 18th, I was fully recovered from my exhaustion of the day before, and I climbed onto the platform just as the Nautilus's chief officer was pronouncing his daily phrase. It then occurred to me that these words either referred to the state of the sea, or that they meant, there's nothing in sight. And in truth, the ocean was deserted, not a sail on the horizon. The tips of Crespo Island had disappeared during the night. The sea, absorbing every color of the prism except its blue rays, reflected the latter in every direction, and sported a wonderful indigo tint. The undulating waves regularly took on the appearance of watered silk with wide stripes. I was marveling at this magnificent ocean view when Captain Nemo appeared. He didn't seem to notice my presence, and began a series of astronomical observations. Then, his operations finished, he went and leaned his elbows on the beacon housing, his eyes straying over the surface of the ocean. Meanwhile, some twenty of the Nautilus's sailors, all energetic, well-built fellows, climbed onto the platform. They had come to pull up the nets left in our wake during the night. These seamen obviously belonged to different nationalities, although indications of European physical traits could be seen in them all. If I'm not mistaken, I recognize some Irishmen, some Frenchmen, a few Slavs, and a native of either Greece or Crete. Even so, these men were frugal of speech, and used among themselves only that bizarre dialect whose origin I couldn't even guess, so I had to give up any notions of questioning them. The nets were hauled on board. They were a breed of trawl resembling those used off the Normandy coast, huge pouches held half open by a floating pole, and a chain laced through the lower meshes. Trailing in this way from these iron glove-makers, the resulting receptacles scoured the ocean floor and collected every marine exhibit in their path. That day they gathered up some unusual specimens from these fish-filled waterways, anglerfish whose comical movements qualify them for the epithet clowns, black Commerson anglers, equipped with their antennas, undulating triggerfish, encircled by little red bands, bloated puffers whose venom is extremely insidious, some all viewed lampreys, snipefish covered with silver scales, cutlassfish whose electrocuting power equals that of the electric eel and the electric ray, scaly featherbacks with brown crosswise bands, greenish codfish, several varieties of goby, and so forth. Finally, some fish of larger proportions, a one-meter jack with a prominent head, several fine bonito from the genus Scomber decked out in the colors blue and silver, and three magnificent tuna whose high speeds couldn't save them from our trawl. I estimate that this cast of the net brought in more than one thousand pounds of fish. It was a fine catch, but not surprising. In essence, these nets stayed in our wake for several hours, incarcerating an entire aquatic world in prisons made of thread. So, we were never lacking in provisions of the highest quality, which the Nautilus's speed and the allure of its electric light could continually replenish. These various exhibits from the sea were immediately lowered down the hatch in the direction of the storage lockers, some to be eaten fresh, others to be preserved. After its fishing was finished and its air supply renewed, I thought the Nautilus would resume its underwater excursion, and I was getting ready to return to my stateroom when Captain Nemo turned to me and said without further preamble— "'Look at this ocean, Professor. "'Doesn't it have the actual gift of life? "'Doesn't it experience both anger and affection? "'Last evening it went to sleep, just as we did, "'and there it is, waking up after a peaceful night. "'No hellos or good mornings for this gent. "'You would have thought this eccentric individual "'was simply continuing a conversation we'd already started. "'See,' he went on, "'it's waking up under the sun's caresses. "'It's going to relive its daily existence.' What a fascinating field of study lies in watching the play of its organism. It owns a pulse and arteries. It has spasms. And I side with the scholarly Commander Mari, who discovered that it has a circulation as real as the circulation of blood in animals. I am sure that Captain Nemo expected no replies from me, and it seemed pointless to pitch in with, Ah, yes, exactly, or how right you are. Rather, he was simply talking to himself with long pauses between sentences, he was meditating out loud. Yes, he said. The ocean owns a genuine circulation, and to start it going, the creator of all things has only to increase its heat, salt, and microscopic animal life. In essence, heat creates the different densities that lead to currents and countercurrents. 
Evaporation, which is nil in the high Arctic regions and very active in equatorial zones, brings about a constant interchange of tropical and polar waters. What's more, I've detected those falling and rising currents that make up the ocean's true breathing. I've seen a molecule of salt water heat up at the surface, sink into the depths, reach maximum density at minus two degrees centigrade, then cool off, grow lighter, and rise again. At the poles, you'll see the consequences of this phenomenon, and through this law of far-seeing nature, you'll understand why water can freeze only at the surface. As the captain was finishing his sentence, I said to myself, "'The pole? Is this brazen individual claiming he'll take us even to that location?' Meanwhile the captain fell silent, and stared at the element he had studied so thoroughly and unceasingly. Then going on, "'Salts,' he said, "'fill the sea in considerable quantities, Professor, and if you removed all its dissolved saline content, you'd create a mass measuring four million five hundred thousand cubic leagues, which, if it were spread all over the globe, would form a layer more than ten meters high. And don't think that the presence of these salts is due merely to some whim of nature. No. They make ocean water less open to evaporation, and prevent winds from carrying off excessive amounts of steam, which, when condensing, would submerge the temperate zones. Salts play a leading role, the role of stabilizer for the general ecology of the globe. Captain Nemo stopped, straightened up, took a few steps along the platform, and returned to me. "'As for these billions of tiny animals,' he went on, "'those infusoria that live by the millions in one droplet of water, eight hundred thousand of which are needed to weigh one milligram, their role is no less important. They absorb the marine salts, they assimilate the solid elements in the water, and since they create coral and madrepores, they're the true builders of limestone continents. And so, after they've finished depriving our water drop of its mineral nutrients, the droplet gets lighter, rises to the surface, there absorbs more salts left behind through evaporation, gets heavier, sinks again, and brings these tiny animals new elements to absorb. The outcome, a double current, rising and falling, constant movement, constant life. More intense than on land, more abundant, more infinite, such life blooms in every part of this ocean. An element fatal to man, they say, but vital to the myriads of animals, and to me. When Captain Nemo spoke in this way, he was transfigured, and he filled me with extraordinary excitement. There, he added, out there lies true existence, and I can imagine the founding of nautical towns, clusters of underwater households that— like the Nautilus, would return to the surface of the sea to breathe every morning, free towns, if ever there were, independent cities. Then again, who knows whether some tyrant— Captain Nemo finished his sentence with a vehement gesture, then, addressing me directly as if to drive away an ugly thought. "'Professor Aranex, he asked me, "'do you know the depth of the ocean floor?' Well, at least, Captain, I know what the major soundings tell us. Could you quote them to me, so I can double-check them as the need arises? Here, I replied, are a few of them that stick in my memory, if I'm not mistaken. An average depth of 8,200 meters was found in the North Atlantic, and 2,500 meters in the Mediterranean. The most remarkable soundings were taken in the South Atlantic, near the 35th parallel, and they gave 12,000 meters— 14,091 meters, and 15,149 meters. All in all, it's estimated that if the sea bottom were made level, its average depth would be about seven kilometers. Well, Professor, Captain Nemo replied, we'll show you better than that, I hope. As for the average depth of this part of the Pacific, I'll inform you that it's a mere 4,000 meters. This said, Captain Nemo headed to the hatch and disappeared down the ladder. I followed him and went back to the main lounge. The propeller was instantly set in motion, and the log gave our speed as twenty miles per hour. Over the ensuing days and weeks, Captain Nemo was very frugal with his visits. I saw him only at rare intervals. His chief officer regularly fixed the positions I found reported on the chart, and in such a way that I could exactly plot the Nautilus's course. Conseil and Land spent the long hours with me. Conseil had told his friend about the wonders of our undersea stroll, and the Canadian was sorry he hadn't gone along. But I hoped an opportunity would arise for a visit to the forests of Oceana. 
Almost every day the panels in the lounge were open for some hours, and our eyes never grew tired of probing the mysteries of this underwater world. The Nautilus's general heading was southeast, and it stayed at a depth between 100 and 150 meters. However, from Lord knows what whim, one day it did a diagonal dive by means of its slanting fins, reaching strata located 2,000 meters underwater. The thermometer indicated a temperature of 4.25 degrees centigrade, which at this depth seems to be a temperature common to all latitudes. On November 26th, at 3 o'clock in the morning, the Nautilus cleared the Tropic of Cancer at longitude 172 degrees. On the 27th, it passed in sight of the Hawaiian Islands, where the famous Captain Cook met his death on February 14th, 1779. By then, we had fared 4,860 leagues from our starting point. When I arrived on the platform that morning, I saw the island of Hawaii, two miles to leeward, the largest of the seven islands making up this group. I could clearly distinguish the tilled soil on its outskirts, the various mountain chains running parallel with its coastline, and its volcanoes crowned by Mauna Kea, whose elevation is 5,000 meters above sea level. Among other specimens from these waterways, our nets brought up some peacock-tailed flabellarian coral polyps flattened into stylish shapes and unique to this part of the ocean. The Nautilus kept to its southeasterly heading. On December 1st, it cut the equator at longitude 142 degrees, and on the 4th of the same month, after a quick crossing marked by no incident, we raised the Marquesas Islands. Three miles off in latitude of 8 degrees, 57 minutes south, and longitude 139 degrees, 32 minutes west, I spotted Martin Point on Nukuhiva, chief member of this island group that belongs to France. I could make out only its wooded mountains on the horizon, because Captain Nemo hated to hug shore. There, our nets brought up some fine fish samples, dolphin fish with azure fins, gold tails, and flesh that's unrivaled in the entire world, ras from the genus Hologymnosis that were nearly denuded of scales, but exquisite in flavor, knife jaws with bony beaks, yellowish albacore that were as tasty as bonito, all fish worth classifying in the ship's pantry. After leaving these delightful islands to the protection of the French flag, the Nautilus covered about 2,000 miles from December 4th to the 11th. Its navigating was marked by an encounter with an immense school of squid, unusual mollusks that are near neighbors of the cuttlefish. French fishermen gave them the name cuckoldfish, and they belonged to the class Cephalopoda, family de branchiata, consisting of themselves together with cuttlefish and argonauts. The naturalists of antiquity made a special study of them, and these animals furnished many ribald figures of speech for soapbox orators in the Greek marketplace, as well as excellent dishes for the tables of rich citizens, if we're to believe Athanasius, a Greek physician predating Galen. It was during the night of December 9th, 10th, that the Nautilus encountered this army of distinctly nocturnal mollusks. They numbered in the millions. They were migrating from the temperate zones towards zones still warmer, following the itineraries of herring and sardines. We stared at them through our thick glass windows. They swam backward with tremendous speed, moving by means of their locomotive tubes, chasing fish and mollusks, eating the little ones eaten by the big ones, and tossing in indescribable confusion the ten feet that nature has rooted in their heads like a hairpiece of new matic snakes. Despite its speed, the Nautilus navigated for several hours in the midst of this school of animals, and its nets brought up an incalculable number, among which... I recognized all nine species that Professor Orbigny has classified as native to the Pacific Ocean. During this crossing, the sea continually lavished us with the most marvelous sights. Its variety was infinite. It changed its setting and decor for the mere pleasure of our eyes, and we were called upon not simply to contemplate the works of our Creator in the midst of the liquid element, but also to probe the ocean's most daunting mysteries. During the day of December 11th, I was busy reading in the main lounge. Ned Land and Conseil were observing the luminous waters through the gaping panels. The Nautilus was motionless, its ballast tanks full. It was sitting at a depth of 1,000 meters in a comparatively unpopulated region of the ocean where only larger fish put in occasional appearances. Just then I was studying a delightful book by Jean Mace, The Servants of the Stomach, and savoring its ingenious teachings when Conseil interrupted my reading. "'Would Master kindly come here for an instant?' he said to me in an odd voice. "'What is it, Conseil? It, it is something that Master should see.' I stood up, went, 
leaned on my elbows before the window, and I saw it. In the broad electric daylight, an enormous black mass, quite motionless, hung suspended in the midst of the waters. I observed it carefully, trying to find out the nature of this gigantic cetacean. Then a sudden thought crossed my mind. A ship! I exclaimed. Yes, the Canadian replied. A disabled craft that's sinking straight down. Ned Land was not mistaken. We were in the presence of a ship whose severed shrouds still hung from their clasps. Its hull looked in good condition, and it must have gone under only a few hours before. The stumps of three masts, chopped off two feet above the deck, indicated a flooding ship that had been forced to sacrifice its masting. But it had heeled sideways, filling completely, and it was listening to port even yet. A sorry sight, this carcass lost under the waves, but sorrier still was the sight on its deck, where, lashed with ropes to prevent their being washed overboard, some human corpses still lay. I counted four of them, four men, one still standing at the helm, then a woman, halfway out of a skylight on the afterdeck, holding a child in her arms. This woman was young. Under the brilliant lighting of the Nautilus's rays, I could make out her features which the water hadn't yet decomposed. With a supreme effort, she had lifted her child above her head, and the poor little creature's arms were still twined around its mother's neck. The postures of the four seamen seemed ghastly to me, twisted from convulsive movements, as if making a last effort to break loose from the ropes that bound them to their ship. And the helmsman, standing alone, calmer, his face smooth and serious, his grizzled hair plastered to his brow, his hands clutching the wheel, seemed, even yet, to be guiding his wrecked three-master through the ocean depths. What a scene! We stood dumbstruck, hearts pounding, before this shipwreck, caught in the act as if it had been photographed in its final moment, so to speak. And already I could see enormous sharks moving in, eyes ablaze, drawn by the lure of human flesh. Meanwhile, turning the Nautilus, made a circle around the sinking ship, and for an instant I could read the board on its stern, the Florida Sunderland, England. Part 1, Chapter 19, Vanacoro this dreadful sight was the first of a whole series of maritime catastrophes that the Nautilus would encounter on its run. When it plied more heavily traveled seas, we often saw wrecked hulls rotting in midwater, and farther down, cannons, shells, anchors, chains, and a thousand other iron objects rusting away. Meanwhile, continuously swept along by the Nautilus, where we lived in near isolation, we raised the Tuamotu Islands on December 11th, that old dangerous group, associated with the French global navigator, Commander Bougainville. It stretches from Ducie Island to Lazareth Island, over an area of 500 leagues from the east-southeast to the west-northwest, between latitude 13 degrees 30 minutes and 23 degrees 50 minutes south, and between longitude 125 degrees 30 minutes and 151 degrees 30 minutes west. This island group covers a surface area of 370 square leagues, and it's made up of some 60 subgroups, among which we noted the Gambier group, which is a French protectorate. These islands are coral formations. Thanks to the work of polyps, a slow but steady upheaval will someday connect these islands to each other. Later on, this new island will be fused to its neighboring island groups, and a fifth continent will stretch from New Zealand and New Caledonia as far as the Marquesas Islands. The day I expounded this theory to Captain Nemo, he answered me coldly, "'The earth doesn't need new continents, but new men.' Sailor's luck led the Nautilus straight to Rio Island, one of the most unusual in this group, which was discovered in 1822 by Captain Bell aboard the Minerva. So I was able to study the madreporic process that has created the islands in this ocean. Madrepores, which one must guard against confusing with precious coral, clothe their tissue in a limestone crust, and their variations in structure have led my famous mentor, Professor Milton Edwards, to classify them into five divisions. The tiny microscopic animals that secrete this polypary live by the billions in the depths of their cells. Their limestone deposits build up into rocks, reefs, islets, islands. In some places they form atolls, a circular ring surrounding a lagoon or small inner lake that gaps place in contact with the sea. 
Elsewhere, they take the shape of barrier reefs, such as those that exist along the coasts of New Caledonia and several of the Tuamotu Islands. In still other localities, such as Reunion Island and the island of Mauritius, they build fringing reefs, high, straight walls, next to which the ocean's depth is considerable. While cruising along only a few cable lengths from the underpinning of Rio Island, I marveled at the gigantic piece of work accomplished by these microscopic laborers. These walls were the express achievements of madreporas, known by the names fire coral, finger coral, star coral, and stony coral. These polyps grow exclusively in the agitated strata at the surface of the sea, and so it's in the upper reaches that they begin these substructures, which sink, little by little, together with the secreted rubble binding them. This, at least, is the theory of Mr. Charles Darwin, who thus explains the formation of atolls, a theory superior, in my view, to the one that says these madreporic edifices sit on the summits of mountains or volcanoes submerged a few feet below sea level. I could observe these strange walls quite closely. Our sounding lines indicated that they dropped perpendicularly for more than 300 meters, and our electric beams made the bright limestone positively sparkle. In reply to a question Conseil asked me about the growth rate of these colossal barriers, I thoroughly amazed him by saying that scientists put it at an eighth of an inch per biennium. Therefore, he said to me, to build these walls it took 192,000 years, my gallant Conseil, which significantly extends the biblical days of creation. What's more, the formation of coal, in other words, the petrification of forests swallowed by floods, and the cooling of basaltic rocks, likewise call for a much longer period of time. I might add that those days in the Bible must represent whole epochs, and not literally the lapse of time between two sunrises, because according to the Bible itself, the sun doesn't date from the first day of creation. When the Nautilus returned to the surface of the ocean, I could take in Rail Island over its whole flat wooded expanse. Obviously, its madreporic rocks had been made fertile by tornadoes and thunderstorms. One day, carried off by a hurricane from neighboring shores, some seed fell onto these limestone beds, mixing with decomposed particles of fish and marine plants to form vegetable hummus. Propelled by the waves, a coconut arrived on this new coast. Its germ took root. Its tree grew tall, catching steam off the water. A brook was born. Little by little, vegetation spread. Tiny animals, worms, insects, rode ashore on tree trunks snatched from islands to windward. Turtles came to lay their eggs. Birds nested in the young trees. In this way, animal life developed, and drawn by the greenery and fertile soil, man appeared. And that's how these islands were formed, the immense achievement of microscopic animals. Near evening, Rail Island melted into the distance, and the Nautilus noticeably changed course. After touching the Tropic of Capricorn at longitude 135 degrees, it headed west-northwest, going back up the whole intertropical zone. Although the summer sun lavished its rays on us, we never suffered from the heat, because thirty or forty meters under water, the temperature didn't go over ten to twelve degrees centigrade. By December 15th, we had left the alluring Society Islands in the west, likewise elegant Tahiti, Queen of the Pacific. In the morning I spotted this island's lofty summits a few miles to leeward. Its waters supplied excellent fish for the tables on board, mackerel, bonito, albacore, and a few varieties of that sea serpent, namely the moray eel. The Nautilus had cleared 8,100 miles. We logged 9,720 miles when we passed between the Tonga Islands, where crews from the Argo, Port-au-Prince, and Duke of Portland had perished, and the island group of Samoa, scene of the slaying of Captain de Lango, friend of that long-lost navigator, the Count de la Parouse. Then we raised the Fiji Islands, where savages slaughtered sailors from the Union, as well as Captain Bureau, commander of the Darling Josephine out of Nantes, France. Extending over an expanse of 100 leagues north to south, and over 90 leagues east to west, this island group lies between latitude 2 degrees and 6 degrees south, and between longitude 174 degrees and 179 degrees west. It consists of a number of islands, islets and reefs, among which we noted the islands of Viti, Levu, Vanua Levu, and Kadavu. It was the Dutch navigator Tasman who discovered this group in 1643, the same year the Italian physicist Torricelli invented the barometer, and King Louis the Fourteenth ascended the French throne. I'll let the readers decide which of these deeds was more beneficial to humanity. 
coming later, Captain Cook in 1774, Rear Admiral de Entrecasteaux in 1793, and finally Captain Dumont d'Urville in 1827, untangled the whole chaotic geography of this island group. The Nautilus drew near Wallier Bay, an unlucky place for England's Captain Dillon, who was the first to shed light on the long-standing mystery surrounding the disappearance of ships under the Count de la Peru. This bay, repeatedly dredged, furnished a huge supply of excellent oysters. As the Roman playwright Seneca recommended, we opened them right at our table, then stuffed ourselves. These mollusks belong to the species known by the name Austria lamellosa, whose members are quite common off Corsica. This Walia oyster bank must have been extensive, and for certain, if they hadn't been controlled by numerous natural checks, these clusters of shellfish would have ended up jam-packing the bay, since as many as two million eggs have been counted in a single individual. And if Mr. Ned Land did not repent of his gluttony at our oyster fest, it's because oysters are the only fish that never causes indigestion. In fact, it takes no less than sixteen dozens of these headless mollusks to supply the 315 grams that satisfy one man's minimum daily requirement for nitrogen. On December 25th, the Nautilus navigated amid the island group of the New Hebrides, which the Portuguese seafarer Quiros discovered in 1606, which Commander Bougainville explored in 1768, and to which Captain Cook gave its current name in 1773. This group is chiefly made up of nine large islands and forms a 120-league strip from the north-northwest to the south-southeast, lying between latitude 2 degrees and 15 degrees south, and between longitude 164 and 168 degrees. At the moment of our noon sights, we passed fairly close to the island of Aru, which looked to me like a mass of green woods crowned by a peak of great height. That day it was Yuletide, and it struck me that Ned Land badly missed celebrating Christmas, that genuine family holiday where Protestants are such zealots. I hadn't seen Captain Nemo for over a week when, on the morning of the 27th, he entered the main lounge, as usual, acting as if he'd been gone for just five minutes. I was busy tracing the Nautilus's course on the world map. The captain approached, placed a finger over a position on the chart, and pronounced just one word. Vanacoro. This name was magic. It was the name of those islets where vessels under the Count de la Peru had miscarried. I straightened suddenly. The Nautilus is bringing us to Vanacoro? I asked. Yes, Professor, the captain replied. And I'll be able to visit those famous islands where the compass and the astrolabe came to grief? If you like, Professor. When will we reach Vanacoro? We already have, Professor. Followed by Captain Nemo, I climbed onto the platform, and from there my eyes eagerly scanned the horizon. In the northeast there emerged two volcanic islands of unequal size, surrounded by a coral reef whose circuit measured forty miles. We were facing the island of Vanacoro proper, to which Captain Dumont de Ville had given the name Island of the Search. We lay right in front of the little harbor of Vanna, located in latitude sixteen degrees four minutes south, and longitude 164 degrees, 32 minutes east. Its shores seemed covered with greenery from its beaches to its summits inland, crowned by Mount Capogo, which is 476 fathoms high. After clearing the outer belt of rocks via a narrow passageway, the Nautilus lay inside the breakers, where the sea had a depth of 30 to 40 fathoms. Under the green shade of some tropical evergreens, I spotted a few savages who looked extremely startled at our approach. In this long, blackish object, advancing flush with the water, didn't they see some fearsome cetacean that they were obliged to view with distrust? Just then, Captain Nemo asked me what I knew about the shipwreck of the Count de la Peru. "'What everybody knows, Captain,' I answered him. "'And could you kindly tell me what everybody knows?' he asked me in a gently ironic tone. "'Very easily.' I related to him what the final deeds of Captain de Monteville had brought to light— Deeds described here in this heavily condensed summary of the whole matter. In 1785, the Count de la Peru and his subordinate, Captain de Langle, were sent by King Louis XVI of France on a voyage to circumnavigate the globe. They boarded two sloops of war, the compass and the astrolabe, which were never seen again. In 1791, justly concerned about the fate of these two sloops of war, the French government fitted out two large cargo boats, the Search and the Hope, which left Brest, on September 28th, under orders from Rear Admiral Bruni de Entrecasteaux. Two months later, testimony from a certain Commander Bowen, 
aboard the Albemarle, alleged that rubble from shipwrecked vessels had been seen on the coast of New Georgia. But D'Entrecasteau was unaware of this news, which seemed a bit dubious anyhow, and headed toward the Admiralty Islands, which had been named in a report by one Captain Hunter as the site of the County Le Perouse shipwreck. They looked in vain. The hope and the search passed right by Vanacoro without stopping there, and overall this voyage was plagued by misfortune, ultimately costing the lives of Rear Admiral D'Entrecasteau, two of his subordinate officers, and several seamen from his crew. It was an old hand at the Pacific, the English adventurer, Captain Peter Dillon, who was the first to pick up the trail left by castaways from the wrecked vessels. On May 15, 1824, his ship, the St. Patrick, passed by Tecopia Island, one of the New Hebrides. There a native boatman pulled alongside in a dugout canoe and sold Dillon a silver sword hilt bearing the imprint of characters engraved with a cutting tool known as a burin. Furthermore, this native boatman claimed that, during a stay in Vanacoro six years earlier, he had seen two Europeans belonging to ships that had run aground on the island's reefs many years before. Dillon guessed that the ships at issue were those under the Count de la Paru, ships whose disappearance had shaken the entire world. He tried to reach Vanacoro, where, according to the native boatman, a good deal of rubble from the shipwreck could still be found, but winds and currents prevented his doing so. Dillon returned to Calcutta. There he was able to interest the Asiatic Society and the East India Company in his discovery. A ship named after the search was placed at his disposal, and he departed on January 23, 1827, accompanied by a French deputy. This new search, after putting in at several stops over the Pacific, dropped anchor before Vanacoro on July 7, 1827, in the same harbor of Havana where the Nautilus was currently floating. There Dillon collected many relics of the shipwreck, iron utensils, anchors, islets from pulleys, swivel guns, and eighteen-pound shell, the remains of some astronomical instruments, a piece of stern rail, and a bronze bell bearing the inscription made by Bazin, the foundry mark at Brest Arsenal, around 1785. There could no longer be any doubt. Finishing his investigations, Dillon stayed at the site of the casualty until the month of October. Then he left Vanacoro, headed toward New Zealand, dropped anchor at Calcutta on April 7, 1828, and returned to France, where he received a very cordial welcome from King Charles X. But just then the renowned French explorer, Captain Dumont d'Urville, unaware of Dillon's activities, had already set sail to search elsewhere for the site of the shipwreck. In essence, a whaling vessel had reported that some metals and a cross of Saint-Louis had been found in the hands of savages in the Luciede Islands and New Caledonia. So Captain Dumont de Ville had put to sea in command of a vessel named after the Astrolabe, and just two months after Dillon had left Vanacoro, Dumont de Ville dropped anchor before Hobart. There he heard about Dillon's findings, and he further learned that a certain James Hobbs, chief officer on the Union out of Calcutta, had put to shore on an island located in latitude 8 degrees 18 minutes south and longitude 150 six degrees, thirty minutes, east, and had noted the natives of those waterways making use of iron bars and red fabrics. Pretty perplexed, de Monterville didn't know if he should give credence to these reports, which had been carried in some of the less reliable newspapers. Nevertheless, he decided to start on Dillon's trail. On February 10, 1828, the new astrolabe, hove before Tecopia Island, took on a guide and interpreter in the person of a deserter who had settled there, plied a course toward Vanacoro, raised it on February 12th, sailed along its reefs until the 14th, and only on the 20th dropped anchor inside its barrier in the harbor of Vanna. On the 23rd, several officers circled the island and brought back some rubble of little importance. The natives, adopting a system of denial and evasion, refused to guide them to the site of the casualty. This rather shady conduct aroused the suspicion that the natives had mistreated the castaways, and in truth, the natives seemed afraid that Dumont de Ville had come to avenge the Count de la Peru and his unfortunate companions. But on the 26th, appeased with gifts and seeing that they didn't need to fear any reprisals, the natives led the chief officer, Mr. Jacquinot, to the site of the shipwreck. At this location, in three or four fathoms of water between the Paiu and Vanna reefs, there lay some anchors, cannons, and ingots of iron and lead, all caked with limestone concretions. A launch and whaleboat from the new astrolabe were steered to this locality, and after going to exhausting lengths, their crews managed to dredge up an anchor weighing eighteen hundred pounds, a cast-iron eight-pounder cannon, a lead ingot, and two copper-swivel guns. 
Questioning the natives, Captain de Monterville also learned that after La Perouse's two ships had miscarried on the island's reefs, the Count had built a smaller craft, only to go off and miscarry a second time. Where? Nobody knew. The commander of the new astrolabe then had a monument erected under a tuft of mangrove in memory of the famous navigator and his companions. It was a simple quadrangular pyramid set on a coral base with no ironwork to tempt the natives' avarice. Then de Monteville tried to depart, but his crews were run down from the fevers raging on these unsanitary shores, and quite ill himself, he was unable to weigh anchor until March 17th. Meanwhile, fearing that de Monteville wasn't abreast of Dillon's activities, the French government sent a sloop of war to Vanacoro, the Bayonnais under Commander Le Gorant de Tromelin, who had been stationed on the American west coast. Dropping anchor before Vanacoro a few months after the new astrolabe's departure, the Bayonnais didn't find any additional evidence, but verified that the savages hadn't disturbed the memorial honoring the Count de la Perou. This is the substance of the account I gave Captain Nemo. So, he said to me, the castaways built a third ship on Vanacoro Island, and to this day nobody knows where it went and perished. Nobody knows. Captain Nemo didn't reply, but signaled me to follow him to the main lounge. The Nautilus sank a few meters beneath the waves, and the panels opened. I rushed to the window and saw crusts of coral, fungus coral, siphonula coral, alcyon coral, sea anemone from the genus Carophilia, plus myriads of charming fish, including greenfish, damselfish, sweepers, snappers, and squirrelfish. Underneath this coral covering, I detected some rubble the old dredges hadn't been able to tear free, iron stirrups, anchors, cannons, shells, tackle from a capstan, a stem post, all objects hailing from the wrecked ships and now carpeted in moving flowers. And as I stared at this desolate wreckage, Captain Nemo told me in a solemn voice, Commander La Perouse set out on December 7, 1785, with his ships, the compass and the astrolabe. He dropped anchor first at Botany Bay, visited the Tonga Islands and New Caledonia, headed toward the Santa Cruz Islands, and put in at Nomuka, one of the islands in the Haapi group. Then his ships arrived at the unknown reefs of Vanacoro. Traveling in the lead, the compass ran afoul of breakers on the southerly coast. The astrolabe went to its rescue and also ran aground. The first ship was destroyed almost immediately. The second, stranded to leeward, held up for some days. The natives gave the castaways a fair enough welcome— the latter took up residence on the island and built a smaller craft with rubble from the two large ones. A few seamen stayed voluntarily in Vanacoro. The others, weak and ailing, set sail with the Count de la Perou. They headed to the Solomon Islands, and they perished with all hands on the westerly coast of the chief island in that group, between Cape Deception and Cape Satisfaction. "'And how do you know all this?' I exclaimed. "'Here's what I found at the very site of that final shipwreck.' Captain Nemo showed me a tin box, stamped with the coat of arms of France, and all corroded by salt water. He opened it, and I saw a bundle of papers, yellowed but still legible. They were the actual military orders given by France's Minister of the Navy to Commander La Peru, with notes along the margin in the handwriting of King Louis the Sixteenth. "'Ah, what a splendid death for a seaman,' Captain Nemo then said. "'A coral grave is a tranquil grave.' and may heaven grant that my companions and I rest in no other. Part 1, Chapter 20 The Torres Strait During the night of December 27th, 28th, the Nautilus left the waterways of Anacoro behind with extraordinary speed. Its heading was southwesterly, and in three days it had cleared the 750 leagues that separated La Perouse's islands from the southeastern tip of Papua. On January 1st, 1868, bright and early, Conseil joined me on the platform. "'Will Master,' the gallant lad said to me, "'allow me to wish him a happy new year.' "'Good heavens, Conseil! "'It's just like old times in my office "'at the Botanical Gardens in Paris. "'I accept your kind wishes, and I thank you for them. "'Only I'd like to know what you mean by a happy year "'under the circumstances in which we're placed. "'Is it a year that will bring our imprisonment to an end, "'or a year that will see this strange voyage continue?' "'Ye gods,' Conseil replied, I hardly know what to tell, Master. We're certainly seeing some unusual things, and for two months we've had no time for boredom. The latest wonder is always the most astonishing, 
and if this progression keeps up, I can't imagine what its climax will be, and my opinion will never again have such an opportunity. Never, Conseil. Besides, Mr. Nemo really lives up to his Latin name, since he couldn't be less in the way if he didn't exist. True enough, Conseil. Therefore, with all due respect to Master, I think a happy year would be a year that lets us see everything. Everything, Conseil? No year could be that long. But what does Ned Land think about all this? Ned Land's thoughts are exactly the opposite of mine, Conseil replied. He has a practical mind and a demanding stomach. He's tired of staring at fish and eating them day in, day out. This shortage of wine, bread, and meat isn't suitable for an upstanding Anglo-Saxon, a man accustomed to beefsteak and unfazed by regular doses of brandy or gin. For my part, Conseil, that doesn't bother me in the least, and I've adjusted very nicely to the diet on board. So have I, Conseil replied. Accordingly, I think as much about staying as Mr. Land about making his escape. Thus, if this new year isn't a happy one for me, it will be for him, and vice versa. No matter what happens, one of us will be pleased. So, in conclusion, I wish Master to have whatever his heart desires. Thank you, Conseil. Only I must ask you to postpone the question of New Year's gifts and temporarily accept a hearty handshake in their place. That's all I have on me. Master has never been more generous, Conseil replied. And with that, the gallant lad went away. By January 2nd, we had fared 11,340 miles, hence 5,250 leagues, from our starting point in the seas of Japan. Before the Nautilus's spur there stretched the dangerous waterways of the Coral Sea, off the northeast coast of Australia. Our boat cruised along a few miles away from that daunting shoal where Captain Cook's ships well-nigh miscarried on June 10, 1770. The craft that Cook was aboard charged into some coral rock, and if his vessel didn't go down, it was thanks to the circumstance that a piece of coral broke off in the collision and plugged the very hole it had made in the hull. I would have been deeply interested in visiting this long, 360-league reef against which the ever-surging sea broke with a fearsome intensity of thunderclaps. But just then, the Nautilus's slanting fins took us to great depths, and I could see nothing of those high coral walls. I had to rest content with the various specimens of fish brought up by our nets. Among others, I noted some long-finned albacore, a species in the genus Scomber, as big as tuna, bluish on the flanks and streaked with crosswise stripes that disappear when the animal dies. These fish followed us in schools and supplied our table with very dainty flesh. We also caught a large number of yellow-green gilthead, half a decimeter long and tasting like dorado, plus some flying gurnards, authentic underwater swallows that on dark nights alternately streak air and water with their phosphorescent glimmers. Among mollusks and zoophytes, I found in our trawl's meshes various species of Alcenarian coral, sea urchins, hammer shells, spurred star shells, winter trap snails, horn shells, glass snails. The local flora was represented by fine floating algae, sea tangle and kelp from the genus Macrocystis, saturated with the mucilage their pores perspire, from which I selected a wonderful Nemostoma gelineroidea, classifying it with the natural curiosities in the museum. On January 4th, two days after crossing the Coral Sea, we raised the coast of Papua. On this occasion, Captain Nemo told me that he intended to reach the Indian Ocean via the Torres Strait. This was the extent of his remarks. Ned saw with pleasure that this course would bring us once again closer to European seas. The Torres Strait is regarded as no less dangerous for its bristling reefs than for the savage inhabitants of its coasts. It separates Queensland from the huge island of Papua, also called New Guinea. Papua is 400 leagues long by 130 leagues wide, with a surface area of 40,000 geographic leagues. It's located between the latitude 0 degrees 19 minutes and 10 degrees 2 minutes south, and between longitude 128 degrees 23 minutes and 146 degrees 15 minutes. At noon, while the chief officer was taking the sun's altitude, I spotted the summits of the Arfak Mountains rising in terraces and ending in sharp peaks. Discovered in 1511 by the Portuguese Francisco Serrano, these shores were successively visited by Don Jorge de Menezes in 1526, by Juan de Grijalva in 1527, 
by the Spanish general Alvaro de Saavedra in 1528, by Inigo Ortiz in 1545, by the Dutchman Schulten in 1616, by Nicholas Sruck in 1753, by Tasman, Dampier, Fumel, Carteret, Edwards, Bougainville, Cook, McClure, and Thomas Forrest, by Rear Admiral de Castaux in 1792, by Louis Isidore Dupare in 1823, and by Captain de Montreville in 1827. It's the heartland of the blacks who occupy all Malaysia, Mr. de Rienzi has said, and I hadn't the foggiest inkling that sailor's luck was about to bring me face to face with these daunting Andaman aborigines. So the Nautilus hove before the entrance to the world's most dangerous strait, a passageway that even the boldest navigators hesitated to clear, the strait that Louis Vaez de Torres faced on returning from the South Seas in Melanesia, the strait in which sloops of war under Captain de Monteville ran aground in 1840 and nearly miscarried with all hands, and even the Nautilus, rising superior to every danger in the sea, was about to become intimate with its coral reefs. The Torres Strait is about thirty-four leagues wide, but it's obstructed by an incalculable number of islands, islets, breakers, and rocks that make it nearly impossible to navigate. Consequently, Captain Nemo took every desired precaution in crossing it. Floating flush with the water, the Nautilus moved ahead at a moderate pace. Like a cetacean's tail, its propeller churned the waves slowly. Taking advantage of this situation, my two companions and I found seats on the ever-deserted platform— "'In front of us stood the pilot-house, and unless I'm extremely mistaken, "'Captain Nemo must have been inside, steering his Nautilus himself. "'Under my eyes I had the excellent charts of the Torres Strait "'that had been surveyed and drawn up by the hydrographic engineer, "'Vinchardon de Moline, and sub-lieutenant, now Admiral, Couvin de Bois, "'who were part of de Monterville's general staff "'during his final voyage to circumnavigate the globe. "'These, along with the efforts of Captain King,' are the best charts for untangling the snarl of this narrow passageway, and I consulted them with scrupulous care. Around the Nautilus the sea was boiling furiously. A stream of waves bearing from southeast to northwest at a speed of two and a half miles per hour broke over heads of coral emerging here and there. "'That's one rough sea,' Ned Land told me. "'Abominable indeed,' I replied, "'and hardly suitable for a craft like the Nautilus.' "'That damned captain,' the Canadian went on, "'must really be sure of his course. "'Because if these clumps of coral so much as brush us, "'they'll rip our hull into a thousand pieces.' "'The situation was indeed dangerous, "'but, as if by magic, "'the Nautilus seemed to glide right down the middle "'of these rampaging reefs. "'It didn't follow the exact course of the Zealous "'in the new astrolabe, "'which had proved so ill-fated for Captain de Monteville. "'It went more to the north.' hugged the Murray Islands, and then returned to the southwest near Cumberland Passage. I thought it was about to charge wholeheartedly into this opening, but it went up to the northwest, through a large number of little-known islands and islets, and steered toward Towned Island and the Bad Channel. I was already wondering if Captain Nemo, rash to the point of sheer insanity, wanted his ship to tackle the narrows where de Montevideo's two sloops of war had gone aground— when he changed direction a second time, and cut straight to the west, heading toward Guaboroa Island. By then it was three o'clock in the afternoon. The current was slacking off. It was almost full tide. The Nautilus drew near this island, which I can see to this day with its remarkable fringe of screw pines. We hugged it from less than two miles out. A sudden jolt threw me down. The Nautilus had just struck a reef, and it remained motionless, listing slightly to port. When I stood up, I saw Captain Nemo and his chief officer on the platform. They were examining the ship's circumstances, exchanging a few words in their incomprehensible dialect. Here is what those circumstances entailed. Two miles to starboard lay Guayboroa Island, its coastline curving north to west like an immense arm. To the south and east, heads of coral were already on display, left uncovered by the ebbing waters. We had run aground at full tide, and in one of those seas whose tides are moderate— an inconvenient state of affairs for floating the Nautilus off. However, the ship hadn't suffered in any way, so solidly joined was its hull. But although it could neither sink nor split open, it was in serious danger of being permanently attached to these reefs, and that would have been the finish of Captain Nemo's submersible. I was mulling this over when the captain approached, cool and calm, forever in control of himself, looking neither alarmed nor annoyed. "'An accident,' I said to him, "'No. 
"'An incident,' he answered me. "'But an incident,' I replied, "'that may oblige you to become a resident again of these shores you avoid?' Captain Nemo gave me an odd look and gestured no, which told me pretty clearly that nothing would ever force him to set foot on a landmass again. Then he said, "'No, Professor Aronnax, the Nautilus isn't consigned to perdition. It will still carry you through the midst of the ocean's wonders. Our voyage is just beginning, and I've no desire to deprive myself so soon of the pleasure of your company.' "'Even so, Captain Nemo,' I went on, ignoring his ironic turn of phrase, the Nautilus has run aground at a moment when the sea is full. Now then, the tides aren't strong in the Pacific, and if you can't unballast the Nautilus, which seems impossible to me, I don't see how it will float off. You're right, Professor. The Pacific tides aren't strong, Captain Nemo replied. But in the Taurus Strait, one still finds a meter and a half difference in level between high and low seas. Today is January 4th, and in five days the moon will be full. Now then... I'll be quite astonished if that good-natured satellite doesn't sufficiently raise these masses of water and do me a favor for which I'll be forever grateful. This said, Captain Nemo went below again to the Nautilus's interior, followed by his chief officer. As for our craft, it no longer stirred, staying as motionless as if these coral polyps had already walled it in with their indestructible cement. "'Well, sir,' Ned Land said to me, coming up after the captain's departure, "'Well, Ned, my friend, we'll serenely wait for the tide on the ninth, "'because it seems the moon will have the good nature to float us away.' "'As simple as that.' "'As simple as that. "'So our captain isn't going to drop his anchors, "'put his engines on the chains, and do anything to haul us off?' "'Since the tide will be sufficient,' Conseil replied simply. "'The Canadian stayed at Conseil, then he shrugged his shoulders. "'The seaman in him was talking now. "'Sir,' he answered, "'You can trust me when I say this hunk of iron will never navigate again, on the seas or under them. It's only fit to be sold for its weight, so I think it's time we gave Captain Nemo the slip.' "'Ned, my friend,' I replied, "'unlike you, I haven't given up on our valiant Nautilus, and in four days we'll know where we stand on these Pacific tides. Besides, an escape attempt might be timely if we were in sight of the coast of England or Provence, but in the waterways of Papua it's another story.' and we'll always have that as a last resort if the Nautilus doesn't right itself, which I'd regard as a real calamity. "'But couldn't we at least get the lay of the land?' Ned went on. "'Here's an island. On this island there are trees. Under those trees land animals loaded with cutlets and roast beef, which I'd be happy to sink my teeth into.' "'In this instance our friend Ned is right,' Conseil said, "'and I side with his views. Couldn't Master persuade his friend Captain Nemo to send the three of us ashore, if only so our feet don't lose the knack of treading on the solid parts of our planet. I can ask him, I replied, but he'll refuse. Let Master take the risk, Conseil said, and we'll know where we stand on the captain's affability. Much to my surprise, Captain Nemo gave me the permission I asked for, and he did so with grace and alacrity, not even exacting my promise to return on board. "'but fleeing across the New Guinea territories would be extremely dangerous, "'and I wouldn't have advised Ned Land to try it. "'Better to be prisoners aboard the Nautilus "'than to fall into the hands of Papuan natives. "'The skiff was put at our disposal for the next morning. "'I hardly needed to ask whether Captain Nemo would be coming along. "'I likewise assumed that no crewman would be assigned to us "'that Ned Land would be in sole charge of piloting the longboat. "'Besides,' The shore lay no more than two miles off, and it would be child's play for the Canadian to guide that nimble skiff through those rows of reefs so ill-fated for big ships. The next day, January 5th, after its deck paneling was opened, the skiff was wrenched from its socket and launched to sea from the top of the platform. Two men were sufficient for this operation. The oars were inside the longboat, and we had only to take our seats. At eight o'clock, armed with rifles and axes, we pulled clear of the Nautilus. The sea was fairly calm. A mild breeze blew from shore. In place by the oars, Conseil and I rode vigorously, and Ned steered us into the narrow lanes between the breakers. The skiff handled easily and sped swiftly. Ned Land couldn't conceal his glee. He was a prisoner escaping from prison and never dreaming he would need to re-enter it. Meat, he kept repeating. Now, we'll eat red meat. Actual game. A real mess call by thunder. 
I'm not saying fish aren't good for you, but we mustn't overdo them, and a slice of fresh venison grilled over live coals will be a nice change from our standard fare. You glutton, Conseil replied. You're making my mouth water. It remains to be seen, I said, whether these forests do contain game, and if the types of game aren't of such size that they can hunt the hunter. Fine, Professor Aranax, replied the Canadian, whose teeth seemed to be as honed as the edge of an axe. But if there's no other quadruped on this island, I'll eat tiger, tiger sirloin. Our friend Ned grows disturbing, Conseil replied. Whatever it is, Ned Land went on, any animal having four feet without feathers or two feet with feathers will be greeted by my very own one-gun salute. Oh, good, I replied. The reckless Mr. Land is at it again. Don't worry, Professor Aronnax. Just keep rowing, the Canadian replied. I only need twenty-five minutes to serve you one of my own special creations. By eight-thirty, the Nautilus's skiff had just gently run aground on a sandy strain after successfully clearing the ring of coral that surrounds Gueboroa Island. Part One, Chapter Twenty-One Some Days Ashore Stepping ashore had an exhilarating effect on me. Ned Land tested the soil with his foot, as if he were laying claim to it. Yet it had been only two months since we had become, as Captain Nemo expressed it, passengers on the Nautilus, in other words, the literal prisoners of its commander. In a few minutes we were a gunshot away from the coast. The soil was almost uncertainly madreporic, but certain dry stream beds were strewn with granite rubble, proving that this island was of primordial origin. The entire horizon was hidden behind a curtain of wonderful forests. Enormous trees, sometimes as high as two hundred feet, were linked to each other by garlands of tropical creepers, genuine natural hammocks that swayed in a mild breeze. There were mimosas, banyan trees, beefwood, teakwood, hibiscus, screw pines, palm trees, all mingling in wild profusion, and beneath the shade of their green canopies at the feet of their gigantic trunks there grew orchids, leguminous plants, and ferns. Meanwhile, ignoring all these fine specimens of Papuan flora, the Canadian passed up the decorative in favor of the functional. He spotted a coconut palm, beat down some of its fruit, broke them open, and we drank their milk and ate their meat with a pleasure that was a protest against our standard fare on the Nautilus. Excellent, Ned Land said. Exquisite, Conseil replied. And I don't think, the Canadian said, that your Nemo would object to us stashing a cargo of coconuts aboard his vessel. I imagine not, I replied, but he won't want to sample them. Too bad for him, Conseil said. And plenty good for us, Ned Land shot back. There'll be more left over. A word of caution, Mr. Land, I told the harpooner, who was about to ravage another coconut palm. Coconuts are admirable things, but before we stuff the skiff with them— it would be wise to find out whether this island offers other substances just as useful. Some fresh vegetables would be well received in the Nautilus's pantry. Master is right, Conseil replied, and I propose that we set aside three places in our longboat, one for fruit, another for vegetables, and a third for venison, of which I still haven't glimpsed the tiniest specimen. Don't give up so easily, Conseil, the Canadian replied. So let's continue our excursion, I went on, but keep a sharp lookout. This island seems uninhabited, but it still might harbor certain individuals who aren't so finicky about the sort of game they eat. <laughs> Ned put in, with a meaningful movement of his jaws. Ned! Oh, horrors! Conseil exclaimed. Oh, ye gods! The Canadian shot back. I'm starting to appreciate the charms of cannibalism. Ned! Ned, don't say that! Conseil answered. "'You a cannibal? Why, I'll no longer be safe next to you, I who share your cabin. Does this mean I'll wake up half-devoured one fine day?' "'I'm awfully fond of your conceal, my friend, but not enough to eat you when there's better food around.' "'Then I daren't delay,' Conceal replied. "'The hunt is on. We absolutely must bag some game to placate this man-eater, or one of these mornings Master won't find enough pieces of his manservant to serve him.' While exchanging this chit-chat, we entered beneath the dark canopies of the forest, and for two hours we explored it in every direction. We couldn't have been luckier in our search for edible vegetation, and some of the most useful produce in the tropical zones supplied us with the valuable foodstuff missing on board. 
I mean, the breadfruit tree, which is quite abundant on Gueboroa Island, and there I chiefly noted the seedless variety that in Malaysia is called Rima. This tree is distinguished from other trees by a straight trunk forty feet high. To the naturalist's eye, its gracefully rounded crown, formed of big, multi-lobed leaves, was enough to denote the autocarpus that has been so successfully transplanted to the Mascarene Islands east of Madagascar. From its massive greenery, huge globular fruit stood out, a decimeter wide, and furnished on the outside with creases that assumed a hexangular pattern. It's a handy plant that nature gives to regions lacking in wheat. Without needing to be cultivated, it bears fruit eight months out of the year. Ned Land was on familiar terms with this fruit. He had already eaten it on his many voyages and knew how to cook its edible substance, so the very sight of it aroused his appetite, and he couldn't control himself. "'Sir,' he told me, "'I'll die if I don't sample a little breadfruit pasta.' "'Sample some, Ned, my friend. Sample all you like. We're here to conduct experiments. Let's conduct them.' "'It won't take a minute,' the Canadian replied. Equipped with a magnifying glass, he lit a fire of deadwood that was soon crackling merrily. Meanwhile, Conseil and I selected the finest autocarpus fruit. Some still weren't ripe enough, and their thick skins covered white, slightly fibrous pulps. But a great many others were yellowish and gelatinous, just begging to be picked. This fruit contained no pits— Conseil brought a dozen of them to Ned Land, who cut them into thick slices and placed them over a fire of live coals, all the while repeating, "'You'll see, sir, how tasty this bread is.' "'Especially since we've gone without baked goods for so long,' Conseil said. "'It's more than just bread,' the Canadian added. "'It's a dainty pastry. You've never eaten any, sir?' "'No, Ned.' "'All right. Get ready for something downright delectable.' If you don't come back for seconds, I'm no longer the king of harpooners. After a few minutes, the parts of the fruit exposed to the fire were completely toasted. On the inside, there appeared some white pasta, a sort of soft bread center, whose flavor reminded me of artichoke. This bread was excellent, I must admit, and I ate it with great pleasure. Unfortunately, I said, this pasta won't stay fresh, so it seems pointless to make a supply for on board. "'By thunder, sir!' Ned Land exclaimed. "'There you go, talking like a naturalist, but meantime I'll be acting like a baker. Conceal, harvest some of this fruit to take with us when we go back.' "'And how will you prepare it?' I asked the Canadian. "'I'll make a fermented batter from its pulp that'll keep indefinitely without spoiling. When I want some, I'll just cook it in the galley on board. It'll have a slightly tart flavor, but you'll find it excellent.' "'So, Mr. Ned?' I see that this bread is all we need. Not quite, Professor, the Canadian replied. We need some fruit to go with it, or at least some vegetables. Then let's look for fruit and vegetables. When our breadfruit harvesting was done, we took to the trail to complete this dry land dinner. We didn't search in vain, and near noontime we had an ample supply of bananas. This delicious produce from the torrid zones ripens all year round, and Malaysians, who give them the name Pizang, eat them without bothering to cook them. In addition to bananas, we gathered some enormous jackfruit with very tangy flavor, some tasty mangoes, and some pineapples of unbelievable size. But this foraging took up a good deal of our time, which even so, we had no cause to regret. Conseil kept Ned under observation. The harpooner walked in the lead, and during his stroll through the forest, he gathered with sure hands some excellent fruit that should have completed his provisions. So, Conseil asked, "'You have everything you need, Ned, my friend.' "'Huh,' the Canadian put in. "'What, you're complaining?' "'All this vegetation doesn't make a meal,' Ned replied. "'Just side dishes, dessert. "'But where's the soup course? Where's the roast?' "'Right,' I said. "'Ned promised us cutlets, which seems highly questionable to me.' "'Sir,' the Canadian replied, "'our hunting not only isn't over, it hasn't even started. "'Patience!' We should end up bumping into some animal with either feathers or fur, if not in this locality, then in another. And if not today, then tomorrow, because we mustn't wander too far off. That's why I propose that we return to the skiff. What? Already? Ned exclaimed. We ought to be back before nightfall, I said. But what hour is it, then? the Canadian asked. Two o'clock at least, Conseil replied. "'Ah, how time flies on solid ground. 
exclaimed Mr. Ned Land, with a sigh of regret. "'Off we go,' Conseil replied. "'So we returned through the forest, and we completed our harvest by making a clean sweep of some palm cabbages that had to be picked from the crowns of their trees, some small beans that I recognized as the abru of the Malaysians, and some high-quality yams. We were overloaded when we arrived at the skiff. However, Ned Land still found these provisions inadequate. But fortune smiled on him. Just as we were boarding, he spotted several trees, twenty-five to thirty feet high, belonging to the palm species. As valuable as the Actocarpus, these trees are justly ranked among the most useful produce in Malaysia. They were sago palms, vegetation that grows without being cultivated. Like mulberry trees, they reproduce by means of shoots and seeds. Ned Lan knew how to handle these trees. Taking his axe and wielding it with great vigor, he soon stretched out on the ground two or three sago palms whose maturity was revealed by the white dust sprinkled over their palm fronds. I watched him more as a naturalist than as a man in hunger. He began by removing from each trunk an inch-thick strip of bark that covered a network of long, hopelessly tangled fibers that were puttied with a sort of gummy flower. This flower was the starch-like sago, an edible substance chiefly consumed by the Melanesian peoples. For the time being, Ned Land was content to chop these trunks into pieces, as if he were making firewood. Later, he would extract the flower by sifting it through cloth to separate it from its fibrous ligaments, let it dry out in the sun, and leave it to harden inside molds. Finally, at five o'clock in the afternoon, laden with all our treasures, we left the island beach, and half an hour later pulled alongside the Nautilus. Nobody appeared on our arrival. The enormous sheet-iron cylinder seemed deserted. Our provisions loaded on board, I went below to my stateroom. There I found my supper ready. I ate, and then fell asleep. The next day, January 6th, nothing new on board. Not a sound inside, not a sign of life. The skiff stayed alongside in the same place we had left it. We decided to return to Gueboroa Island. Ned Land hoped for better luck in his hunting than on the day before, and he wanted to visit a different part of the forest. By sunrise we were off. Carried by an inbound current, the longboat reached the island in a matter of moments. We disembarked, and thinking it best to abide by the Canadian's instincts, we followed Ned Land, whose long legs threatened to outpace us. Ned Land went westward up the coast. Then, fording some stream beds, he reached open plains that were bordered by wonderful forests. Some kingfishers lurked along the watercourses, but they didn't let us approach. Their cautious behavior proved to me that these winged creatures knew where they stood on bipeds of our species, and I concluded that if this island wasn't inhabited, at least human beings paid it frequent visits. After crossing a pretty lush prairie, we arrived on the outskirts of a small wood, enlivened by the singing and soaring of a large number of birds. "'Still they're merely birds,' Conseil said. "'But some are edible,' the harpooner replied. "'Wrong, Ned, my friend,' Conseil answered, "'because I see only ordinary parrots here.' "'Conseil, my friend,' Ned replied in all seriousness. "'Parrots are like pheasant to people with nothing else on their plates.' "'And I might add,' I said, "'that when these birds are properly cooked, "'they're at least worth a stab of the fork.' Indeed, under the dense foliage of this wood, a whole host of parrots fluttered from branch to branch, needing only the proper upbringing to speak human dialects. At present they were cackling in chorus with parakeets of every color, with solemn cockatoos that seemed to be pondering some philosophical problem, while bright red lorries passed by like pieces of bunting borne on the breeze, in the midst of kaleo parrots raucously on the wing. Papuan lorries painted the subtlest shades of azure, and a whole variety of delightfully winged creatures, none terribly edible. However, one bird unique to these shores, which never passes beyond the boundaries of the Aru and Papuan Islands, was missing from this collection. But I was given a chance to marvel at it soon enough. After crossing through a moderately dense thicket, we again found some plains obstructed by bushes. There I saw some magnificent birds soaring aloft, the arrangement of their long feathers causing them to head into the wind. Their undulating flight, the grace of their aerial curves, and the play of their colors allured and delighted the eye. I had no trouble identifying them. "'Birds of paradise!' I exclaimed. "'Order Passeriforma, Division Clistomora. Conseil replied. "'Partridge family?' Ned Land asked. "'I doubt it, Mr. Land. Nevertheless, I'm counting on your dexterity to catch me one of these delightful representatives of tropical nature. I'll give it a try, Professor, though I'm handier with a harpoon than a rifle. 
Malaysians, who do a booming business in these birds with the Chinese, have various methods for catching them that we couldn't use. Sometimes they set snares on the tops of the tall trees that the bird of paradise prefers to inhabit. At other times they capture it with a tenacious glue that paralyzes its movements. They will even go so far as to poison the springs where these fowl habitually drink. But in our case, all we could do was fire at them on the wing, which left us little chance of getting one, and in truth, we used up a good part of our ammunition in vain. Near eleven o'clock in the morning, we cleared the lower slopes of the mountains that formed the island center, and we still hadn't bagged a thing. Hunger spurred us on. The hunters had counted on consuming the proceeds of their hunting, and they had miscalculated. Luckily, and much to his surprise, Conceal put off a right and left shot and ensured our breakfast. He brought down a white pigeon and a ring dove, which were briskly plucked, hung from a spit, and roasted over a blazing fire of deadwood. While these fascinating animals were cooking, Ned prepared some bread from the Arctocarpus. Then the pigeon and ring dove were devoured to the bones and declared excellent. Nutmeg, on which these birds habitually gorge themselves, sweetens their flesh and makes it delicious eating. They taste like chicken stuffed with truffles, Conseil said. All right, Ned. I asked the Canadian. Now what do you need? Game with four paws, Professor Aranex, Ned Land replied. All these pigeons are only appetizers, snacks. So till I've bagged an animal with cutlets, I won't be happy. Nor I, Ned, until I've caught a bird of paradise. Then let's keep hunting, Conseil replied, but while heading back to the sea. We've arrived at the foothills of these mountains, and I think we'll do better if we return to the forest regions. It was good advice, and we took it. After an hour's walk, we reached a genuine sago palm forest. A few harmless snakes fled underfoot. Birds of paradise stole off at our approach, and I was in real despair of catching one when Conseil, walking in the lead, stooped suddenly, gave a triumphant shout, and came back to me carrying a magnificent bird of paradise. Oh, bravo, Conseil! I exclaimed. Master is too kind, Conseil replied. Not at all, my boy. That was a stroke of genius, catching one of these live birds with your bare hands. If Master will examine it closely, he'll see that I deserve no great praise. And why not, Conseil? Because this bird is as drunk as a lord. Drunk? Yes, Master, drunk from the nutmegs it was devouring under that nutmeg tree where I caught it. See, Ned, my friend, see the monstrous results of intemperance? Damnation! the Canadian shot back. "'Considering the amount of gin I've had these past two months, "'you've got nothing to complain about.' "'Meanwhile, I was examining this unusual bird. "'Conseil was not mistaken. "'Tipsy from that potent juice, "'our bird of paradise had been reduced to helplessness. "'It was unable to fly. "'It was barely able to walk. "'But this didn't alarm me, "'and I just let it sleep off its nutmeg. "'This bird belonged to the finest "'of the eight species credited to Papua "'and its neighboring islands.' It was a great emerald, one of the rarest birds of paradise. It measured three decimeters long, its head was comparatively small, and its eyes, placed near the opening of its beak, were also small. But it offered a wonderful mixture of hues, a yellow beak, brown feet and claws, hazel wings with purple tips, pale yellow head and scruff of the neck, emerald throat, the belly and chest maroon to brown. Two strands made of a horn substance covered with down rose over its tail, which was lengthened by a long, very light feather of wonderful fineness, and they completed the costume of this marvelous bird that the islanders have poetically named the Sunbird. How I wished I could take this superb bird of paradise back to Paris to make a gift of it to the zoo at the Botanical Gardens, which doesn't own a single live specimen. So, uh, it must be a rarity or something? the Canadian asked in the tone of a hunter who, from the viewpoint of his art, gives the game a pretty low rating. A great rarity, my gallant comrade, and above all very hard to capture alive. And even after they're dead, there's still a major market for these birds, so the natives have figured out how to create fake ones like people create fake pearls or diamonds. What? Conseil exclaimed. They make counterfeit birds of paradise? Yes, Conseil. And is Master familiar with how the islanders go about it? perfectly familiar. During the easterly monsoon seasons, birds of paradise lose the magnificent feathers around their tails that naturalists call below-the-wing feathers. These feathers are gathered by the foul foragers and skillfully fitted into some poor previously mutilated parakeet. 
Then they paint over the suture, varnish the bird, and ship the fruits of their unique labors to museums and collectors in Europe. Good enough, Ned Land put in. If it isn't the right bird, it's still the right feathers, and so long as the merchandise isn't meant to be eaten, I see no great harm. But if my desires were fulfilled by the capture of this bird of paradise, those of our Canadian huntsmen remained unsatisfied. Luckily, near two o'clock, Ned Land brought down a magnificent wild pig of the type the natives call Berry Utang. This animal came in the nick of time for us to bag some real quadruped meat, and it was warmly welcomed. Ned Land proved himself quite gloriously with his gunshot. Hit by an electric bullet, the pig dropped dead on the spot. The Canadian properly skinned and cleaned it, after removing half a dozen cutlass, destined to serve as the grilled meat course of our evening meal. Then the hunt was on again, and once more would be marked by the exploits of Ned and Conseil. In essence beating the bushes, the two friends flushed a herd of kangaroos that fled by bounding away on their elastic paws. But these animals didn't flee so swiftly that our electric capsules couldn't catch up with them. "'Oh, Professor!' shouted Ned Land, whose hunting fever had gone to his brain. "'What excellent game, especially in a stew! What a supply for the Nautilus! Two, three, five down! And just think how we'll devour all this meat ourselves, while those numb skulls on board won't get a shred!' In his uncontrollable glee, I think the Canadian might have slaughtered the whole horde if he hadn't been so busy talking. But he was content with a dozen of these fascinating marsupials which make up the first order of aplacental mammals, as Conseil just had to tell us. These animals were small in stature. They were a species of those rabbit kangaroos that usually dwell in the hollows of trees and are tremendously fast. But although of moderate dimensions, they at least furnished a meat that's highly prized. We were thoroughly satisfied with the results of our hunting— a gleeful Ned proposed that we return the next day to this magic island which he planned to depopulate of its every edible quadruped. But he was reckoning without events. By six o'clock in the evening we were back on the beach. The skiff was aground in its usual place. The Nautilus, looking like a long reef, emerged from the waves two miles offshore. Without further ado, Ned Land got down to the important business of dinner. He came wonderfully to terms with its entire cooking. Grilling over the coals, those cutlets from the Bari Utang soon gave off a succulent aroma that perfumed the air. But I catch myself following in the Canadian's footsteps. Look at me, in ecstasy over freshly grilled pork. Please grant me a pardon, as I have already granted one to Mr. Land, and on the same grounds. In short, dinner was excellent. Two ring doves rounded out this extraordinary menu. Sago pasta, bread from the autocarpus, mangoes, half a dozen pineapples, and the fermented liquor from certain coconuts heightened our glee. I suspect that my two fine companions weren't quite as clear-headed as one could wish. "'What if we don't return to the Nautilus this evening?' Conseil said. "'What if we never return to it?' Ned Land added. Just then a stone whizzed toward us, landed at our feet, and cut short the harpooner's proposition." Part 1. Chapter 22. The Lightning Bolts of Captain Nemo Without standing up, we stared in the direction of the forest, my hand stopping halfway to my mouth, Ned Land's completing its assignment. "'Stones don't fall from the sky,' Conseil said, "'or else they deserve to be called meteorites.' A second, well-polished stone removed a tasty ring-dove leg from Conseil's hand, giving still greater reverence to his observation." We all three stood up, rifles to our shoulders, ready to answer any attack. "'Apes, maybe?' Ned Land exclaimed. "'Nearly,' Conseil replied. "'Savages!' "'Head for the skiff,' I said, moving toward the sea. Indeed, it was essential to be to retreat, because some twenty natives, armed with bows and slings, apparently appeared barely a hundred paces off, on the outskirts of a thicket that masked the horizon to our right.' The skiff was aground, ten fathoms away. The savages approached without running, but they favoured us with a show of the greatest hostility. It was raining stones and arrows. Ned Land was unwilling to leave his provisions behind, and despite the impending danger, he clutched his pig on one side, his kangaroos on the other, and scampered off with respectable speed. In two minutes we were on the strand, loading provisions and weapons into the skiff, pushing it to sea, and positioning its two oars were the work of an instant. 
We hadn't gone two cable lengths when a hundred savages, howling and gesticulating, entered the water up to their waists. I looked to see if their appearance might draw some of the Nautilus's men onto the platform. But no. Lying well out, that enormous machine still seemed completely deserted. Twenty minutes later, we boarded ship. The hatches were open. After mooring the skiff, we re-entered the Nautilus's interior. I went below to the lounge, from which some cords were wafting. Captain Nemo was there, leaning over the organ, deep in a musical trance. Captain, I said to him. He didn't hear me. Captain, I went on, touching him with my hand. He trembled and turned around. Ah, it's you, Professor, he said to me. Well, did you have a happy hunt? Was your herb gathering a success? Yes, Captain, I replied. But unfortunately, we've brought back a horde of bipeds whose proximity worries me. What sort of bipeds? Savages. Savages, Captain Nemo replied in an ironic tone. You set foot on one of the shores of this globe, Professor, and you're surprised to find savages there? Where aren't there savages? And besides, are they any worse than men elsewhere, these people you call savages? Uh, but, Captain, speaking for myself, sir, I've encountered them everywhere. Well, then, I replied, if you don't want to welcome them aboard the Nautilus, you'd better take some precautions. Easy, Professor. No cause for alarm. But there are a large number of these natives. What's your count? At least a hundred. Professor Aronnax, replied Captain Nemo, whose fingers took their places again on the organ keys. If every islander in Papua were to gather on that beach, the Nautilus would still have nothing to fear from their attacks. The captain's fingers then ran over the instrument's keyboard, and I noticed that he touched only its black keys, which gave his melodies a basically Scottish colour. Soon he had forgotten my presence and was lost in a reverie that I no longer tried to dispel. I climbed onto the platform. Night had already fallen, because in this low latitude the sun sets quickly without any twilight. I could see Gueboroa Island only dimly, but numerous fires had been kindled on the beach, attesting that the natives had no thoughts of leaving it. For several hours I was left to myself, sometimes musing on the islanders, but no longer fearing them because the captain's unflappable confidence had won me over, and sometimes forgetting them to marvel at the splendors of this tropical night. My memories took wing toward France in the wake of those zodiacal stars due to twinkle over it in a few hours. The moon shone in the midst of the constellations at the zenith. I then remembered that this loyal, good-natured satellite would return to this same place the day after tomorrow to raise the tide and tear the Nautilus from its coral bed. Near midnight, seeing that all was quiet over the darkened waves as well as under the waterside trees, I repaired to my cabin and fell into a peaceful sleep. The night passed without mishap. No doubt the Papuans had been frightened off by the mere sight of this monster aground in the bay, because our hatches stayed open, offering easy access to the Nautilus's interior. At six o'clock in the morning, January 8th, I climbed onto the platform. The morning shadows were lifting. The island was soon on view through the dissolving mists, first its beaches, then its summits. The islanders were still there, in greater numbers than on the day before, perhaps five hundred or six hundred of them. Taking advantage of the low tide, some of them had moved forward over the heads of coral to within two cable lengths of the Nautilus. I could easily distinguish them. They obviously were true Papuans, men of fine stock, athletic in build, forehead high and broad, nose large but not flat, teeth white. Their woolly red-tinted hair was in sharp contrast to their bodies, which were black and glistening like those of Nubians. Beneath their pierced, distended earlobes, there dangled strings of beads made from bone. Generally, these savages were naked. I noted some women among them, dressed from hip to knee in grass skirts, held up by belts made of vegetation. Some of the chieftains adorned their necks with crescents and with necklaces made from beads of red and white glass. On with bows, arrows, and shields, nearly all of them carried from their shoulders a sort of net which held those polished stones their slings hurl with such dexterity. One of these chieftains came fairly close to the Nautilus, examining it with care. He must have been a mado of high rank, because he paraded in a mat of banana leaves that had ragged edges and was accented with bright colors. I could easily have picked off this islander, he stood at such close range, but I thought it best to wait for an actual show of hostility. Between Europeans and savages, it's acceptable for Europeans to shoot back, but not to attack first. During this whole time of low tide, the islanders lurked near the Nautilus, but they weren't boisterous. 
I often heard them repeat the word Asai, and from their gestures I understood they were inviting me to go ashore, an invitation I felt obliged to decline. So the skiff didn't leave shipside that day, much to the displeasure of Mr. Land, who couldn't complete his provisions. The adroit Canadian spent his time preparing the meat and flour products he had brought from Gueboroa Island. As for the savages, they went back to shore near eleven o'clock in the morning, when the heads of coral began to disappear under the waves of the rising tide. But I saw their numbers swell considerably on the beach. It was like that they had come from neighboring islands or from the mainland of Papua proper. However, I didn't see one local dugout canoe. Having nothing better to do, I decided to dredge these beautiful clear waters which exhibited a profusion of shells, zoophytes, and open sea plants. Besides, it was the last day the Nautilus would spend in these waterways, if tomorrow it still floated off to the open sea as Captain Nemo had promised. So I summoned Conseil, who brought me a small, light dragnet similar to those used in oyster fishing. What about these savages? Conseil asked me. With all due respect to Master, they don't strike me as very wicked. They're cannibals, even so, my boy. A person can be both a cannibal and a decent man, Conseil replied, just as a person can be both gluttonous and honorable. The one doesn't exclude the other. Fine, Conseil, and I agree that there are honorable cannibals who decently devour their prisoners. However, I am opposed to being devoured, even in all decency, so I'll keep on my guard, especially since the Nautilus's commander seems to be taking no precautions. And now let's get to work. For two hours, our fishing proceeded energetically, but without bringing up any rarities. Our dragnet was filled with Midas abalone, harp shells, obelisk snails, and especially the finest hammer shells I had seen to that day. We also gathered in a few sea cucumbers, some pearl oysters, and a dozen small turtles that we saved for the ship's pantry. But just when I least expected it, I laid my hands on a wonder, a natural deformity, I'd have to call it, something very seldom encountered. Conseil had just made a cast of the dragnet, and his gear had come back up loaded with a variety of fairly ordinary seashells, when suddenly he saw me plunge my arms swiftly into the net, pull out a shelled animal, and give a conchological yell, in other words, the most piercing yell a human throat can produce. "'Ah! Oh, what happened to Master?' Conseil asked, very startled. "'Did Master get bitten?' "'No, my boy, but I'd gladly have sacrificed a finger for such a find.' "'What find?' "'This shell,' I said, displaying the subject of my triumph. "'But that's simply an olive shell of the tent olive species, "'genus oliva, order Pectumbranchia, "'class gastropoda, branch mollusca. "'Yes, yes, Conseil, but instead of coiling from right to left, "'this olive shell rolls from left to right.' "'It can't be,' Conseil exclaimed. "'Yes, my boy, it's a left-handed shell.' "'A left-handed shell?' Conseil repeated, his heart pounding. "'Look at its spiral!' "'Oh, Master can trust me on this,' Conseil said, taking the valuable shell in trembling hands. "'But never have I felt such excitement!' And there was good reason to be excited. In fact, as naturalists have ventured to observe, dextrality is a well-known law of nature. In their rotational and orbital movements, stars and their satellites go from right to left. Man uses his right hand more often than his left, and consequently his various instruments and equipment, staircases, locks, watch springs, etc., are designed to be used in a right-to-left manner. Now then, nature has generally obeyed this law in coiling her shells. They are right-handed with only rare exceptions, and when by chance a shell's spiral is left-handed, collectors will pay its weight in gold for it. So, Conseil and I were deep in the contemplation of our treasure, and I was solemnly promising myself to enrich the Paris Museum with it, when an ill-timed stone hurled by one of the islanders whizzed over and shattered the valuable object in Conseil's hands. I gave a yell of despair. Conseil pounced on his rifle and aimed at a savage swinging a sling just ten meters away from him. I tried to stop him, but his shot went off and shattered a bracelet of amulets dangling from the islander's arm. Conseil, I shouted, Conseil! Ha! Ah, what? Didn't Master see that this man-eater initiated the attack? A shell isn't worth a human life, I told him. Oh, the rascal, Conseil exclaimed. I'd rather he cracked my shoulder. Conseil was in dead earnest, but I didn't subscribe to his views. However, the situation had changed in only a short time, and we hadn't noticed. 
Now some twenty dugout canoes were surrounding the Nautilus. Hollowed from tree trunks, these dugouts were long, narrow, and well designed for speed, keeping their balance by means of two bamboo poles that floated on the surface of the water. They were maneuvered by skillful half-naked paddlers, and I viewed their advance with definite alarm. It was obvious these Papuans had already entered into relations with Europeans and knew their ships. But this long, iron cylinder lying in the bay with no mast or funnels, what were they to make of it? Nothing good, because at first they kept it at a respectful distance. However, seeing that it stayed motionless, they regained confidence little by little and tried to become more familiar with it. Now, then, it was precisely this familiarity that we needed to prevent. Since our weapons made no sound when they went off, they would have only a moderate effect on these islanders who reputedly respect nothing but noisy mechanisms. Without thunderclaps, lightning bolts would be much less frightening, although the danger lies in the flash, not the noise. Just then, the dugout canoes drew nearer to the Nautilus, and a cloud of arrows burst over us. "'Fire and brimstone, it's hailing!' Conseil said, and poisoned hail, perhaps. "'We've got to alert Captain Nemo,' I said, re-entering the hatch. I went below to the lounge. I found no one there. I ventured a knock at the door opening into the captain's stateroom. The word, enter, answered me. I did so, and found Captain Nemo busy with calculations in which there was no shortage of X and other algebraic signs. "'Am I disturbing you?' I said, out of politeness. "'Correct, Professor Aronnax.' The captain answered me. But I imagine you have pressing reasons for looking me up. Very pressing. Native dugout canoes are surrounding us, and in a few minutes we're sure to be assaulted by several hundred savages. Ah! Captain Nemo put in serenely. They've come in their dugouts? Yes, sir. Well, sir, closing the hatches should do the trick. Precisely, and that's what I came to tell you. Nothing easier, Captain Nemo said and he pressed an electric button, transmitting an order to the crew's quarters. "'There, sir. All under control,' he told me after a few moments. "'The skiff is in place, and the hatches are closed. I don't imagine you're worried that these gentlemen will stave in walls that shells from your frigate couldn't breach.' "'No, Captain, but one danger still remains.' "'What's that, sir? Tomorrow, at about this time, we'll need to reopen the hatches to renew the Nautilus's air.' "'No argument, sir.' since our craft breathes in the manner favoured by cetaceans. But if these Papuans are occupying the platform at that moment, I don't see how you can prevent them from entering. Then, sir, you assume they'll board the ship? I'm certain of it. Well, sir, let them come aboard. I see no reason to prevent them. And deep down there are just poor devils, these Papuans, and I don't want my visit to Gueboroa Island to cost the life of a single one of these unfortunate people. On this note I was about to withdraw— but Captain Nemo detained me and invited me to take a seat next to him. He questioned me with interest on our excursions ashore and on our hunting, but seemed not to understand the Canadian's passionate craving for red meat. Then our conversation skimmed various subjects, and without being more forthcoming, Captain Nemo proved more affable. Among other things, we came to talk of the Nautilus's circumstances, a ground in the same strait where Captain Dumont de Urville had nearly miscarried. Then, pertinent to this— "'He was one of your great seamen,' the captain told me. "'One of your shrewdest navigators, that Derville. "'He was the Frenchman's Captain Cook. "'A man wise, but unlucky, "'braving the ice banks of the South Pole, "'the coral of Oceania, the cannibals of the Pacific, "'only to perish wretchedly in a train wreck. "'If that energetic man was able to think about his life "'in its last seconds, imagine what his final thoughts must have been.' "'As he spoke,' Captain Nemo seemed deeply moved, an emotion I felt was to his credit. Then, chart in hand, we returned to the deeds of the French navigator, his voyages to circumnavigate the globe, his double attempt at the South Pole, which led to his discovery of the Adelie coast and the Louis-Philippe Peninsula. Finally, his hydrographic surveys of the chief islands in Oceania. "'What your Durville did on the surface of the sea,' Captain Nemo told me, "'I've done in the ocean's interior.' but more easily, more completely than he. Constantly tossed about by hurricanes, the zealous and the new astrolabe couldn't compare with the Nautilus, a quiet workroom truly at rest in the midst of the waters. Even so, Captain, I said, there is one major similarity between Dumont d'Aville's sloops of war and the Nautilus. What's that, sir? 
Like them, the Nautilus has run aground. The Nautilus is not aground, sir, Captain Nemo replied icily. The Nautilus was built to rest on the ocean floor, and I don't need to undertake the arduous labors the maneuvers of Durville had to attempt in order to float off his sloops of war. The Zealous and the new Astrolabe well nigh perished, but my Nautilus is in no danger. Tomorrow, on the day stated, and at the hour stated, the tide will peacefully lift it off, and it will resume its navigating through the seas. "'Captain,' I said, "'I don't doubt tomorrow,' Captain Nemo added, standing up, "'tomorrow at two-forty in the afternoon, the Nautilus will float off and exit the Torres Strait undamaged.' Pronouncing these words in an extremely sharp tone, Captain Nemo gave me a curt bow. This was my dismissal, and I re-entered my stateroom. There I found Conseil, who wanted to know the upshot of my interview with the captain. "'My boy,' I replied, "'when I expressed the belief that these Papuan natives were a threat to his Nautilus, the captain answered me with great irony. So I have just one thing to say to you. Have faith in him, and sleep in peace.' "'Master has no need for my services.' "'No, my friend. What's Ned Land up to?' "'Begging Master's indulgence,' Conseil replied. "'But our friend Ned is concocting a kangaroo pie that will be the eighth wonder.' I was left to myself. I went to bed, but slept pretty poorly. I kept hearing noises from the savages who were stamping on the platform and letting out deafening yells. The night passed in this way, without the crew ever emerging from their usual inertia. They were no more disturbed by the presence of these man-eaters than soldiers in an armored fortress are troubled by ants running over the armor plate. I got up at six o'clock in the morning. The hatches weren't open, so the air inside hadn't been renewed, but the air tanks were kept full for any eventuality and would function appropriately to shoot a few cubic meters of oxygen into the Nautilus's thin atmosphere. I worked in my stateroom until noon without seeing Captain Nemo even for an instant. "'Nobody on board seemed to be making any preparations for departure. "'I still waited for a while. "'Then I made my way to the main lounge. "'Its timepiece marked 2.30. "'In ten minutes the tide would reach its maximum elevation, "'and if Captain Nemo hadn't made a rash promise, "'the Nautilus would immediately break free. "'If not, many months might pass before it could leave its coral bed. "'But some preliminary vibrations could soon be felt over the boat's hull.' I heard its plating grind against the limestone roughness of that coral base. At 2.35, Captain Nemo appeared in the lounge. "'We're about to depart,' he said. "'Ah,' I put in. "'I've given orders to open the hatches.' "'What about the Papuans?' "'What about them?' Captain Nemo replied, with a light shrug of his shoulders. "'Won't they come inside the Nautilus?' "'How will they manage that?' "'By jumping down the hatches you're about to open.' "'Professor Aranax, Captain Nemo replied serenely, "'the Nautilus's hatches aren't to be entered in that fashion even when they're open.' "'I gaped at the captain. "'You don't understand,' he said to me. "'Not in the least. "'Well, come along and you'll see.' "'I headed to the central companionway. "'They are very puzzled. "'Ned Land and Conseil watched the crewmen opening the hatches "'while a frightful clamor and furious shouts resounded outside. "'The hatch lids fell back onto the outer plating. Twenty horrible faces appeared. "'But when the first islander laid hands on the companionway railing, "'he was flung backward by some invisible power, Lord knows what. "'He ran off howling in terror and wildly prancing around. Ten of his companions followed him. "'All ten met the same fate.' Conceal was in ecstasy. Carried away by his violent instincts, Ned Land leaped up the companionway, but as soon as his hand seized the railing, he was thrown backward in his turn. "'Damnation!' he exclaimed. "'I've been struck by a lightning bolt!' These words explained everything to me. It wasn't just a railing that led to the platform. It was a metal cable fully charged with the ship's electricity." "'Anyone who touched it got a fearsome shock, "'and such a shock would have been fatal "'if Captain Nemo had thrown the full current "'from his equipment into this conducting cable. "'It could honestly be said "'that he had stretched between himself and his assailants "'a network of electricity no one could clear with impunity. "'Meanwhile, crazed with terror, "'the unhinged Papuans beat a retreat. "'As for us, half laughing, "'we massaged and comforted poor Ned Land, "'who was swearing like one possessed.' But just then, 
Lifted off by the tide's final undulations, the Nautilus left its coral bed at exactly that fortieth minute pinpointed by the captain. Its propeller churned the waves with lazy majesty. Gathering speed, little by little, the ship navigated on the surface of the ocean, and safe and sound, it left behind the dangerous narrows of the Torres Strait. Part 1, Chapter 23 Agri Somnia Editorial Note This is Latin for Troubled Dreams. The following day, January 10th, the Nautilus resumed its travels in midwater, but at a remarkable speed that I estimated to be at least 35 miles per hour. The propeller was going so fast I could neither follow nor count its revolutions. I thought about how this marvelous electric force not only gave motion, heat, and light to the Nautilus, but even protected it against outside attack, transforming it into a sacred ark no profane hand could touch without being blasted. My wonderment was boundless, and it went from the submersible itself to the engineer who had created it. We were traveling due west, and on January 11th we doubled Cape Wessel, located in longitude 135 degrees and latitude 10 degrees north, the western tip of the Gulf of Carpentaria. Reefs were still numerous, but more widely scattered, and were fixed on the chart with the greatest accuracy. The Nautilus easily avoided the money breakers to port, and the Victoria reefs to starboard, positioned at longitude 130 degrees on the 10th parallel, which we went along rigorously. On January 13th, arriving in the Timor Sea, Captain Nemo raised the island of that name at longitude 122 degrees. This island, whose surface area measures 1,625 square leagues, is governed by Rajas. These aristocrats deem themselves the sons of crocodiles, in other words, descendants with the most exalted origins to which a human being can lay claim. Accordingly, their scaly ancestors infest the island's rivers and are the subjects of special veneration. They are sheltered, nurtured, flattered, pampered, and offered a ritual diet of nubile maidens, and woe to the foreigner who lifts a finger against these sacred saurians. But the Nautilus wanted nothing to do with these nasty animals. Timor Island was visible for barely an instant at noon while the chief officer determined his position. I also caught only a glimpse of little Roti Island, part of this same group, whose women have a well-established reputation for beauty in the Malaysian marketplace. After our position fix, the Nautilus's latitude bearings were modulated to the southwest. Our prow pointed to the Indian Ocean. Where would Captain Nemo's fancies take us? Would he head up to the shores of Asia? Would he pull nearer to the beaches of Europe? Unlikely choices for a man who avoided populated areas. So, would he go down south? Would he double the Cape of Good Hope, then Cape Horn, and push on to the Antarctic Pole? Finally, would he return to the seas of the Pacific, where his Nautilus could navigate freely and easily? Time would tell. After cruising along the Cartier, Hibernia, Serengapatam, and Scott Reefs, the solid element's last exertions against the liquid element, we were beyond all sight of shore by January 14th. The Nautilus slowed down in an odd manner, and very unpredictable in its ways. It sometimes swam in the midst of the waters, sometimes drifted on their surface. During this phase of our voyage, Captain Nemo conducted interesting experiments on the different temperatures in various strata of the sea. Under ordinary circumstances, such readings are obtained using some pretty complicated instruments whose findings are dubious to say the least, whether they're thermometric sounding lines, whose glass often shatters under the water's pressure, or those devices based on the varying resistance of metals to electric currents. The results so obtained can't be adequately double-checked. By contrast, Captain Nemo would seek the sea's temperature by going himself to its depths, and when he placed his thermometer in contact with the various layers of liquid, he found the sought-for degree immediately and with certainty. And so, by loading up its ballast tanks, or by sinking obliquely with its slanting fins, the Nautilus successively reached depths of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 7,000, 9,000, and 10,000 meters, and the ultimate conclusion from these experiments was that, in all latitudes, the sea had a permanent temperature of 4.5 degrees centigrade at a depth of 1,000 meters. I watched these experiments with the most intense fascination. Captain Nemo brought a real passion to them. I often wondered why he took these observations. Were they for the benefit of his fellow man? It was unlikely, because sooner or later his work would perish with him in some unknown sea, unless he intended the results of his experiments for me. But that meant this strange voyage of mine would come to an end, and no such end was in sight. 
Be that as it may, Captain Nemo also introduced me to the different data he had obtained on the relative densities of the water in our globe's chief seas. From this news I derived some personal enlightenment having nothing to do with science. It happened the morning of January 15th. The captain, with whom I was strolling on the platform, asked me if I knew how salt water differs in density from sea to sea. I said no, adding that there was a lack of rigorous scientific observations on this subject. "'I have taken such observations,' he told me, "'and I can vouch for their reliability.' "'Fine,' I replied. "'But the Nautilus lives in a separate world, and the secrets of its scientists don't make their way ashore.' "'You're right, Professor,' he told me, after a few moments of silence. "'This is a separate world. It's as alien to the Earth as the planets accompanying our globe around the Sun, and will never become familiar with the work of scientists on Saturn or Jupiter.' But since fate has linked our two lives, I can reveal the results of my observations to you. I'm all attention, Captain. You're aware, Professor, that salt water is denser than fresh water, but this density isn't uniform. In essence, if I represent the density of fresh water by one, then I find 1.028 for the waters of the Atlantic, 1.026 for the waters of the Pacific, 1.030 for the waters of the Mediterranean. Aha! I thought, so he ventures into the Mediterranean. 1.018 for the waters of the Ionian Sea, and 1.029 for the waters of the Adriatic. Assuredly, the Nautilus didn't avoid the heavily traveled seas of Europe, and from this insight I concluded that the ship would take us back, perhaps very soon, to more civilized shores. I expected Ned Land to greet this news with unfeigned satisfaction. For several days our work hours were spent in all sorts of experiments, on the degree of salinity in waters of different depths, or on their electric properties, coloration, and transparency, and in every instance Captain Nemo displayed an ingenuity equaled only by his graciousness towards me. Then I saw no more of him for some days, and again lived on board in seclusion. On January 16th the Nautilus seemed to have fallen asleep just a few meters beneath the surface of the water. Its electric equipment had been turned off, and the motionless propeller let it ride with the waves. I assumed that the crew were busy with interior repairs, required by the engine's strenuous mechanical action. My companions and I then witnessed an unusual sight. The panels in the lounge were open, and since the Nautilus's beacon was off, a hazy darkness reigned in the midst of the waters. Covered with heavy clouds, the stormy sky gave only the faintest light to the ocean's upper strata. I was observing the state of the sea under these conditions, and even the largest fish were nothing more than ill-defined shadows, when the Nautilus was suddenly transferred into broad daylight. At first I thought the beacon had gone back on and was casting its electric light into the liquid mass. I was mistaken, and after a hasty examination I discovered my error. The Nautilus had drifted into the midst of some phosphorescent strata which, in this darkness, came off as positively dazzling. This effect was caused by myriads of tiny, luminous animals whose brightness increased when they glided over the metal hull of our submersible. In the midst of these luminous sheets of water, I then glimpsed flashes of light like those seen inside a blazing furnace from streams of molten lead or from masses of metal brought to a white heat, flashes so intense that certain areas of the light became shadows by comparison, in a fiery setting from which every shadow should seemingly have been banished. No. This was no longer the calm emission of our usual lighting. This light throbbed with unprecedented vigor and activity. You sensed that it was alive. In essence, it was a cluster of countless open-sea infusoria, or noctiluca, an eighth of an inch wide, actual globules of transparent jelly equipped with a thread-like tentacle, up to twenty-five thousand of which have been counted in thirty cubic centimeters of water and the power of their light was increased by those glimmers unique to medusas, starfish, common jellyfish, angel-winged clams, and other phosphorescent zoophytes, which were saturated with grease from organic matter decomposed by the sea, and perhaps with mucus secreted by fish. For several hours the Nautilus drifted in this brilliant tide, and our wonderment grew when we saw huge marine animals cavorting in it, like the fire-dwelling salamanders of myth. In the midst of these flames that didn't burn— I could see swift, elegant porpoises, the tireless pranksters of the sea, and sailfish three meters long, those shrewd heralds of hurricanes whose fearsome broadswords sometimes banged against the lounge window. Then smaller fish appeared, 
miscellaneous triggerfish, leatherjacks, unicornfish, and a hundred others that left stripes on this luminous atmosphere in their course. Some magic lay behind this dazzling sight. Perhaps some atmospheric condition had intensified this phenomenon. Perhaps a storm had been unleashed on the surface of the waves. But only a few meters down, the Nautilus felt no tempest's fury, and the ship rocked peacefully in the midst of the calm waters. And so it went, some new wonder constantly delighting us. Conseil observed and classified his zoophytes, articulates, mollusks, and fish. The days passed quickly, and I no longer kept track of them. Ned, as usual, kept looking for changes of pace from our standard fare. Like actual snails, we were at home in our shell, and I can vouch that it's easy to turn into a full-fledged snail. So this way of living began to seem simple and natural to us, and we no longer envisioned a different lifestyle on the surface of the planet Earth, when something happened to remind us of our strange circumstances. On January 18th, the Nautilus lay in longitude 105 degrees and latitude 15 degrees south. The weather was threatening, the sea rough and billowy, the wind was blowing a strong gust from the east, the barometer, which had been falling for some days, forecast an approaching struggle of the elements. I had climbed onto the platform just as the chief officer was taking his readings of our angles. Out of habit, I waited for him to pronounce his daily phrase, but that day it was replaced by a different phrase, just as incomprehensible. Almost at once, I saw Captain Nemo appear, lift his spyglass, and inspect the horizon. For some minutes, the captain stood motionless, rooted to the spot contained within the field of his lens. Then he lowered his spyglass and exchanged about ten words with his chief officer. The latter seemed to be in the grip of an excitement he tried in vain to control. More in command of himself, Captain Nemo remained cool. Furthermore, he seemed to be raising certain objections that his chief officer kept answering with flat assurances. At least, that's what I gathered from their inference in tone and gesture. As for me... I stared industriously in the direction under observation, but without spotting a thing. Sky and water merged into a perfectly clean horizon line. Meanwhile, Captain Nemo strolled from one end of the platform to the other, not glancing at me, perhaps not even seeing me. His step was firm, but less regular than usual. Sometimes he would stop, cross his arms over his chest, and observe the sea. What could he be looking for over that immense expanse? By then, the Nautilus lay hundreds of miles from the nearest coast. The chief officer kept lifting his spyglass and stubbornly examining the horizon, walking up and down, stamping his foot in his nervous agitation, a sharp contrast to his superior. But this mystery would inevitably be cleared up, and soon, because Captain Nemo gave orders to increase speed, at once the engine stepped up its drive power, setting the propeller in swifter rotation. Just then, the chief officer drew the captain's attention anew. The latter interrupted his strolling and aimed his spyglass at the point indicated. He observed it a good while. As for me, deeply puzzled, I went below to the lounge and brought back an excellent long-range telescope I habitually used. Leaning my elbows on the beacon housing which jutted from the stern of the platform, I got set to scour that whole stretch of sky and sea. But no sooner had I peered into the eyepiece than the instrument was snatched from my hands. I spun around. Captain Nemo was standing before me. But I almost didn't recognize him. His facial features were transfigured, gleaming with dark fire. His eyes had shrunk beneath his frowning brow. His teeth were half bared. His rigid body, clenched fists, and head drawn between his shoulders all attested to a fierce hate breathing from every pore. He didn't move. My spyglass fell from his hand and rolled at his feet. Had I accidentally caused these symptoms of anger? Did this incomprehensible individual think I had detected some secret forbidden to guests on the Nautilus? No. I wasn't the subject of his hate, because he wasn't even looking at me. His eyes stayed stubbornly focused on that inscrutable point of the horizon. Finally, Captain Nemo regained his self-control. His facial appearance, so profoundly changed, now resumed its usual calm. He addressed a few words to his chief officer in their strange language. Then he turned to me. "'Professor Aranax,' he told me in a tone of some urgency, "'I ask that you now honor one of the binding agreements between us.' "'Which one, Captain?' "'You and your companions must be placed in confinement until I see fit to set you free.' "'You're in command,' I answered, gaping at him. "'But may I address a question to you?' "'You may not, sir.' 
After that, I stopped objecting and started obeying, since resistance was useless. I went below to the cabin occupied by Ned Land and Conseil, and I informed them of the captain's decision. I'll let the reader decide how this news was received by the Canadian. In any case, there was no time for explanations. Four crewmen were waiting at the door, and they led us to the cell where we had spent our first night aboard the Nautilus. Ned Land tried to lodge a complaint, but the only answer he got was a door shut in his face. "'Will Master tell me what this means?' Conseil asked me. I told my companions what had happened. They were as astonished as I was, but no wiser. Then I sank into deep speculation, and Captain Nemo's strange facial seizure kept haunting me. I was incapable of connecting two ideas in logical order, and I had strayed into the most absurd hypotheses when I was snapped out of my mental struggles by these words from Ned Land. "'Well, look here. Lunch is served.' Indeed, the table had been laid. Apparently, Captain Nemo had given this order at the same time he commanded the Nautilus to pick up speed. "'Will Master allow me to make him a recommendation?' Conseil asked me. "'Yes, my boy,' I replied. "'Well, Master needs to eat his lunch. It's prudent because we have no idea what the future holds.' "'You're right, Conseil.' "'Unfortunately,' Ned Land said, "'they've only given us the standard menu.' "'Ned, my friend,' Conseil answered, "'what would you say if they'd given us no lunch at all?' This dose of sanity cut the harpooner's complaints clean off. We sat down at the table. Our meal proceeded pretty much in silence. I ate very little. Conseil, everlastingly prudent, force-fed himself, and, despite the menu, Ned Land didn't waste a bite. Then, lunch over, each of us propped himself in a corner. Just then, the luminous globe lighting our cell went out, leaving us in profound darkness. Ned Land soon dozed off, and to my astonishment, Conseil also fell into a heavy slumber. I was wondering what could have caused this urgent need for sleep, when I felt a dense torpor saturate my brain. I tried to keep my eyes open, but they closed in spite of me. I was in the grip of anguished hallucinations. Obviously, some sleep-inducing substance had been laced into the food we'd just eaten, so imprisonment wasn't enough to conceal Captain Nemo's plans from us. Sleep was needed as well. Then I heard the hatches close— the sea's undulations, which had been creating a gentle rocking motion, now ceased. Had the Nautilus left the surface of the ocean? Was it re-entering the motionless strata deep in the sea? I tried to fight off this drowsiness. It was impossible. My breathing grew weaker. I felt a mortal chill freeze my dull, nearly paralyzed limbs. Like little domes of lead, my lids fell over my eyes. I couldn't raise them. A morbid sleep, full of hallucinations, seized my whole being. Then the visions disappeared and left me in utter oblivion. Part 1 Chapter 24 The Coral Realm The next day I woke up with my head unusually clear. Much to my surprise, I was in my stateroom. No doubt my companions had been put back in their cabin without noticing it any more than I had. Like me, they would have no idea what took place during the night, and to unravel this mystery... I could count only on some future happenstance. I then considered leaving my stateroom. Was I free, or still a prisoner? Perfectly free. I opened my door, headed down the gangways, and climbed the central companionway. Hatches that had been closed the day before were now open. I arrived on the platform. Ned Land and Conseil were there waiting for me. I questioned them. They knew nothing. Lost in a heavy sleep of which they had no memory, they were quite startled to be back in their cabin. As for the Nautilus, it seemed as tranquil and mysterious as ever. It was cruising on the surface of the waves at a moderate speed. Nothing seemed to have changed on board. Ned Land observed the sea with his penetrating eyes. It was deserted. The Canadian sighted nothing new on the horizon, neither sail nor shore. A breeze was blowing noisily from the west, and, disheveled by the wind, long billows made the submersible roll very noticeably. After renewing its air, the Nautilus stayed at an average depth of fifteen meters, enabling it to return quickly to the surface of the waves, and, contrary to custom, it executed such a maneuver several times during that day of January 19th. The chief officer would then climb onto the platform, and his usual phrase would ring through the ship's interior. As for Captain Nemo, he didn't appear. Of the other men on board, I saw only my emotionless steward who served me with his usual mute efficiency. 
Near two o'clock, I was busy organizing my notes in the lounge when the captain opened the door and appeared. I bowed to him. He gave me an almost imperceptible bow in return, without saying a word to me. I resumed my work, hoping he might give me some explanation of the previous afternoon's events. He did nothing of the sort. I stared at him. His face looked exhausted. His reddened eyes hadn't been refreshed by sleep. His facial features expressed profound sadness, real chagrin. He walked up and down, sat and stood, picked up a book at random, discarded it immediately, consulted his instruments without taking his customary notes, and seemed unable to rest easy for an instant. Finally, he came over to me and said, "'Are you a physician, Professor Aronnax?' This inquiry was so unexpected that I stared at him a good while without replying. "'Are you a physician?' he repeated. "'Several of your scientific colleagues took their degrees in medicine, such as Gratulet, Mokintandon, and others.' "'Well, that's right,' I said. "'I am a doctor. I used to be on call at the hospitals. I was in practice for several years before joining the museum.' "'Excellent, sir.' My reply obviously pleased Captain Nemo. But not knowing what he was driving at, I waited for further questions, ready to reply as circumstances dictated. "'Professor Aronnax,' the captain said to me, "'would you consent to give your medical attention to one of my men?' "'Someone is sick?' "'Yes. I am ready to go with you. Come. I admit that my heart was pounding. Lord knows why, but I saw a definite connection between this sick crewman and yesterday's happenings, and the mystery of those events concerned me at least as much as the man's sickness. Captain Nemo led me to the Nautilus's stern, and invited me into a cabin located next to the sailors' quarters. On a bed there lay a man some forty years old, with strongly moulded features, the very image of an Anglo-Saxon. I bent over him. Not only was he sick, he was wounded— Swathed in blood-soaked linen, his head was resting on a folded pillow. I undid the linen bandages while the wounded man gazed with great staring eyes and let me proceed without making a single complaint. It was a horrible wound. The cranium had been smashed open by some blunt instrument, leaving the naked brains exposed, and the cerebral matter had suffered deep abrasions. Blood clots had formed in this dissolving mass, taking on the color of wine dregs. Both contusion and concussion of the brain had occurred. The sick man's breathing was labored, and muscle spasms quivered in his face. Cerebral inflammation was complete, and had brought on a paralysis of movement and sensation. I took the wounded man's pulse. It was intermittent. The body's extremities were already growing cold, and I saw that death was approaching without any possibility of my holding it in check. After dressing the poor man's wound, I redid the linen bandages around his head, and I turned to Captain Nemo. "'How did he get this wound?' I asked him. "'That's not important,' the captain replied evasively. "'The Nautilus suffered a collision that cracked one of the engine levers, and it struck this man. My chief officer was standing beside him. This man leaped forward to intercept the blow. A brother lays down his life for his brother, a friend for his friend. What could be simpler?' That's the law for everyone on board the Nautilus. But what's your diagnosis of his condition? I hesitated to speak my mind. You may talk freely, the captain told me. This man doesn't understand French. I took a last look at the wounded man, then I replied, This man will be dead in two hours. Nothing can save him. Nothing. Captain Nemo clenched his fists, and tears slid from his eyes, which I had thought incapable of weeping. For a few minutes more I observed the dying man, whose life was ebbing little by little. He grew still more pale under the electric light that bathed his deathbed. I looked at his intelligent head, furrowed with premature wrinkles that misfortune, perhaps misery, had etched long before. I was hoping to detect the secret of his life in the last words that might escape from his lips. "'You may go.' "'Professor Aronnax, Captain Nemo told me. "'I left the captain in the dying man's cabin, "'and I repaired to my stateroom, very moved by this scene. "'All day long I was a quiver with gruesome forebodings. "'That night I slept poorly, "'and between my fitful dreams I thought I heard a distant moaning, "'like a funeral dirge. "'Was it a prayer for the dead, murmured in that language I couldn't understand? "'The next morning I climbed on deck.' 
Captain Nemo was already there. As soon as he saw me, he came over. Professor, he said to me, would it be convenient for you to make an underwater excursion today? With my companions, I asked, if they're agreeable. We're yours to command, Captain. Then kindly put on your diving suits. As for the dead or dying man, he hadn't come into the picture. I rejoined Ned Land and Conseil. I informed them of Captain Nemo's proposition. Conseil was eager to accept, and this time the Canadian proved perfectly amenable to going with us. It was eight o'clock in the morning. By eight-thirty we were suited up for this new stroll and equipped with our two devices for lighting and breathing. The double door opened, and accompanied by Captain Nemo, with a dozen crewmen following, we set foot on the firm seafloor where the Nautilus was resting ten meters down. A gentle slope gravitated to an uneven bottom whose depth was about fifteen fathoms. This bottom was completely different from the one I had visited during my first excursion under the waters of the Pacific Ocean. Here I saw no fine-grained sand, no underwater prairies, not one open-sea forest. I immediately recognized the wondrous region in which Captain Nemo did the honors that day. It was the coral realm. In the zoophyte branch, class Alcyonaria, one finds the order Gorgonaria, which contains three groups, sea fans, Isidian polyps, and coral polyps. It's in this last that precious coral belongs, an unusual substance that at different times has been classified in the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms. Medicine to the ancients, jewelry to the moderns, it wasn't decisively placed in the animal kingdom until 1694 by Paysonel of Marseille. A coral is a unit of tiny animals assembled over a polypary that's brittle and stony in nature. These polyps have a unique generating mechanism that reproduces them via the budding process, and they have an individual existence while also participating in a communal life. Hence, they embody a sort of natural socialism. I was familiar with the latest research on this bizarre zoophyte, which turns to stone while taking on a tree form, as some naturalists have very aptly observed, and nothing could have been more fascinating to me than to visit one of these petrified forests that nature has planted on the bottom of the sea. We turned on our Rumkorf devices and went along a coral shoal in the process of forming, which, given time, will some day close off this whole part of the Indian Ocean. Our path was bordered by hopelessly tangled bushes formed from snarls of shrubs all covered with little star-shaped white-streaked flowers. Only, contrary to plants on shore, these tree forms become attached to rocks on the seafloor by heading from top to bottom. Our lights produced a thousand delightful effects while playing over these brightly colored boughs. I fancied I saw these cylindrical membrane-filled tubes trembling beneath the water's undulations. I was tempted to gather their fresh petals, which were adorned with delicate tentacles, some newly in bloom, others barely opened, while nimble fish with fluttering fins brushed past them like flocks of birds. But if my hands came near the moving flowers of these sensitive, lively creatures, an alarm would instantly sound throughout the colony. The white petals retracted into their red sheaths, the flowers vanished before my eyes, and the bush changed into a chunk of stony nipples. Sheer chance had placed me in the presence of the most valuable specimens of this zoophyte. This coral was the equal of those fished up from the Mediterranean off the Barbary coast or the shores of France and Italy. With its bright colors, it lived up to those poetic names of blood flower and blood foam that the industry confers on its finest exhibits. Coral sells for as much as five hundred francs per kilogram, and in this locality the liquid strata hid enough to make the fortunes of a whole host of coral fishermen. This valuable substance often merges with other polyparies, forming compact, hopelessly tangled units known as macchiota, and I noted some wonderful pink samples of this coral. But as the bushes shrank, the tree forms magnified. Actual, petrified thickets and long alcoves from some fantastic school of architecture kept opening up before our steps. Captain Nemo entered beneath a dark gallery whose gentle slope took us to a depth of one hundred meters. The light from our glass coils produced magical effects at times, lingering on the wrinkled roughness of some natural arch, or some overhang suspended like a chandelier, which our lamps flecked with fiery sparks. Amid these shrubs of precious coral, I observed other polyps no less unusual. Melita coral, rainbow coral with jointed outgrowths, then a few tufts of genus Coralina, 
some green and others red, actually a type of seaweed encrusted with limestone salts, which, after long disputes, naturalists have finally placed in the vegetable kingdom. But, as one intellectual has remarked, here, perhaps, is the actual point where life rises humbly out of slumbering stone, but without breaking away from its crude starting point. Finally, after two hours of walking, we reached a depth of about three hundred meters, in other words, the lowermost limit at which coral can begin to form. But here it was no longer some isolated bush or a modest grove of low timber. It was an immense forest, huge mineral vegetation, enormous petrified trees linked by garlands of elegant hydras from the genus Plumularia, those tropical creepers of the sea, all decked out in shades and gleams. We passed freely under their lofty boughs, lost up in the shadows of the waves, while at our feet organ-pipe coral, stony coral, star coral, fungus coral, and sea anemone from the genus Caryophyllia formed a carpet of flowers all strewn with dazzling gems. What an indescribable sight! Oh, if only we could share our feelings! Why were we imprisoned behind these masks of metal and glass? Why were we forbidden to talk with each other? At least let us lead the lives of the fish that populate this liquid element, or better yet, the lives of the amphibians which can spend long hours either at sea or on shore, travelling through their double domain as their whims dictate. Meanwhile, Captain Nemo had called a halt. My companions and I stopped walking, and, turning around, I saw the crewmen form a semicircle around their leader. Looking with greater care, I observed that four of them were carrying on their shoulders an object that was oblong in shape. At this locality, we stood in the center of a huge clearing surrounded by the tall tree forms of this underwater forest. Our lamps cast a sort of brilliant twilight over the area, making inordinately long shadows on the seafloor. Past the boundaries of the clearing, the darkness deepened again, relieved only by little sparkles given off by the sharp crests of coral. Ned Land and Conseil stood next to me. We stared, and it dawned on me that I was about to witness a strange scene. Observing the seafloor, I saw that it swelled at certain points from low bulges that were encrusted with limestone deposits and arranged with a symmetry that betrayed the hand of man. In the middle of the clearing, on a pedestal of roughly piled rocks, there stood a cross of coral, extending long arms you would have thought were made of petrified blood. At a signal from Captain Nemo, one of his men stepped forward, and a few feet from this cross detached a mattock from his belt and began to dig a hole. I finally understood. This clearing was a cemetery, this hole a grave, that oblong object the body of the man who must have died during the night. Captain Nemo and his men had come to bury their companion in this communal resting place on the inaccessible ocean floor. No. My mind was reeling as never before. Never had ideas of such impact raced through my brain. I didn't want to see what my eyes saw. Meanwhile, the grave-digging went slowly. Fish fled here and there as their retreat was disturbed. I heard the pick ringing on the limestone soil, its iron tip sometimes giving off sparks when it hit a stray piece of flint on the sea bottom. The hole grew longer, wider, and soon was deep enough to receive the body. Then the pallbearers approached, wrapped in white fabric made from filaments of the fan muscle, the body was lowered into its watery grave. Captain Nemo, arms crossed over his chest, knelt in a posture of prayer, as did all the friends of him who had loved them. My two companions and I bowed reverently. The grave was then covered over with the rubble dug from the sea floor, and it formed a low mound. When this was done, Captain Nemo and his men stood up. Then they all approached the grave, sank again on bended knee, and extended their hands in a sign of final farewell. Then the funeral party went back up the path to the Nautilus, returning beneath the arches of the forest, through the thickets, along the coral bushes, going steadily higher. Finally, the ship's rays appeared. Their luminous trail guided us to the Nautilus. By one o'clock we had returned. After changing clothes, I climbed onto the platform, and in the grip of dreadfully obsessive thoughts, I sat next to the beacon. Captain Nemo rejoined me. I stood up and said to him, so, as I predicted, that man died during the night. Yes, Professor Aronnax, Captain Nemo replied. And now he 
rests beside his companions in that coral cemetery. Yes, forgotten by the world, but not by us. We dig the graves, then entrust the polyps with sealing away our dead for eternity. And with a sudden gesture, the captain hid his face in his clenched fists, vainly trying to hold back a sob. Then he added, There lies our peaceful cemetery, hundreds of feet beneath the surface of the waves. At least, Captain, your dead can sleep serenely there, out of the reach of sharks. Yes, sir, Captain Nemo replied solemnly, of sharks and men. The End of Chapter 24 and the End of the First Part of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne